Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alan Cockle, and I'm the Senior Director of Health Programs here at the Pew Charitable Trusts. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to a symposium on transparency at the FDA. Today's meeting, I should clarify, is not a Pew meeting. Uh, but we do have a robust portfolio of FDA-focused work here at the Trusts, uh, efforts to pass and implement the Food Safety Modernization Act, a focus on medical devices, especially the potential of using the unique device identifier to improve monitoring of devices throughout the product lifecycle. We have successfully worked on products to encourage innovation, particularly around antibiotics, and to ensure appropriate use of antibiotics in various settings. And we focused on drug safety, uh, and uh, transparency in the supply chain, uh, and especially on the safety of compounded drugs. Uh, among other things, Pew submitted comments to the FDA Transparency Task Force back in 2010 uh, that touch on some of the topics that we will be discussing today. In fact, reading the background papers for today's meeting reminded me of a, of a meeting that we convened in a room directly above us here a few years ago on the topic of regulatory predictability at the FDA, bringing together industry leaders uh, and senior officials from the FDA to talk about what do we really mean when we talk about the challenge of predictability. And one of the things that emerged from that is something that you may touch on today, which is sometimes the FDA asks for new data uh, on applications late in the game, and, and companies are left wondering why are they asking about this at this late stage. And the FDA said, sometimes we know things from other applications and other products that we're looking at, but we can't tell them what we know or why we know. And one of the ideas that came out of that was uh, making the uh, FDA's complete response letters available. And, and with that, as with so many things today, you'll be thinking about the trade-off between public good and, and private rights, and, and how do you balance those and, and find the right sweet spot. Um, all of this is just to say that we share with other stakeholders in the room a, an interest in transparency and effective governance at the FDA. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Gottlieb, prior to his current role, uh, shared with, with, with many of you uh, the perspective an outside, of an outsider watching the agency closely and, and trying to figure out um, how do we achieve an optimal regulatory system. Josh Sharstein, of course, in his time at the FDA, uh, was responsible or for FDA track, which brought together hundreds of performance indicators at the, at the agency um, in an attempt to move towards transparency and a, an external dashboard that uh, the people could use to monitor the agency. So uh, you're in good hands today as you grapple with these key questions about transparency of various kinds of uh, process and, and, and clinical data. So with that, let me turn it over to Josh Sharfstein. Good morning, and thank you, Alan and the Pew Foundation, for hosting today's event. My name is Josh Sharfstein. I'm the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the former Principal Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Um, I uh, also want to acknowledge um, and thank the, John, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, which sponsored the blueprint for transparency that we will be talking about today, as well as the special issue of the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics that's being released today, and uh, for sponsoring today's event. Uh, I want to thank um, Anna Davis, Jim Miller, and Caleb Alexander from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Aaron Kesselheim from Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Joe Ross and Margaret McCarthy from Yale Medical School and Yale Law School, who all uh, worked with, with me and with our students, Anam Chaudhry and Brian Smith, um, in drafting the blueprint um, that is uh, now available online. Today's discussion will take this document as a starting point and focus on criti critical aspects of transparency. And um, I also want to thank uh, Nick Enquist and Barbara Benham and Susan Morrow and Robin Scullin and the whole team at, at the School of Public Health that has made today's event possible. Now, I first became interested in transparency at FDA when I was part of the transition in 2009 um, at FDA, where we met with about 60 different groups that were engaged with the agency. I noticed that many of them seemed to be mad at the FDA and for very different reasons. In fact, they could be mad about the same decision the FDA made from completely different vantage points. 
And as we went through just meeting with, with group after group after group, um, I realized that every single one of them, if they didn't understand an agency decision, would, would think about it as a worst case scenario. This is what it meant. They would may bring all kinds of assumptions, even if they were wildly different from group to group. And it is unquestionably true that FDA can handle a very challenging regulatory matter well. In fact, do a better job than any other agency in the world, and yet if the action is not well explained, can still fail in the court of public opinion and lead to more um, frustration. Later, when I was actually serving at FDA, I attended a press conference at the National Press Club where the agency announced that FDA uh, had worked with NIH and industry to make available to researchers data from the placebo arms of studies on Alzheimer's disease, and that that data was then gonna, uh, going to help drive um, research forward faster. And I appreciated on the one hand, how hard Janet Woodcock and the team at the uh, CEDAR had worked to create that transparency uh, of data. And on the other hand, that, that um, the data that FDA uses and the information and the insight that it brings has value far beyond a regulatory decision. Even if one drug fails, um, the information generated could actually set the stage for the next advance. Now, um, you heard that I was involved in transparency in 2009 and 2010, and that initial work was kind of lonely. Everyone at FDA is focused on the issues of the day, and there are many different issues that hit FDA all the time. You just can pick up any newspaper and, and see them. Um, so uh, it was a little lonely, but support came from some unusual sources, including uh, Scott Gottlieb. Um, even though we worked on, uh, in administrations with different political colors, uh, Scott was incredibly generous with his time when I started in the Obama administration, and we talked about all of the essential and critical and timeless issues at FDA, including HR, the clearance process, and, um, and transparency. Um, it is, not surprise, it is no surprise to me that Dr. Gottlieb's tenure at FDA so far has been so productive. He has announced major steps in tobacco control, pursued important enforcement efforts against dangerous and ineffective products, worked to end the games that undermine the market for generic drugs, and supported the work of thousands of scientists in the agency to keep on top of rapidly changing science. He spent time at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health where he has impressed students, faculty, and others with his deep understanding of many different issues, often in response to rapid fire questions from students. So uh, it was uh, very, very important. People stopped me in the halls and say, who was that again who came? Um, when I visited FDA for a talk on the opioid epidemic, I found Scott eating lunch with the employees in the cafeteria, I'm not locked in a soundproof booth. <laughs> Most importantly, he has kept FDA's focus on its public health mission. And that's why I'm so pleased to invite him to make the opening remarks for today's conference. Dr. Gottlieb. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I, um, Dr. Sharfstein and I um, have had a dialogue over many years, and I appreciate uh, the relationship that we've had uh, talking about policy issues. When, when he was at FDA, I wrote a article calling on the agency to start releasing the complete response letters. And then I uh, wrote a subsequent article saying, uh, what's taking you so long, Josh? So I've been waiting for him to return the favor. And uh, I just got a copy of it. So I, I appreciate it very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks for uh, Johns Hopkins for hosting this and, and Pew for providing the space. Transparency can be uh, a powerful tool for innovation, as Dr. Sharfstein noted. New platforms for analyzing and visualizing large, complex data sets present important new opportunities for the research and development community, for regulators, and for clinicians. It allows people to harness data to advance the safe and effective and efficient development of new therapies to address unmet medical needs, to tailor clinical care to individual patient characteristics and preferences, and to communicate information supporting regulatory decision-making in ways that engender greater public confidence in those decisions. 
The FTA's goal is to advance transparency without reducing incentives to innovate. This can be accomplished by meeting our statutory responsibility for protecting confidential commercial information, trade secrets, and personally identifiable data while disseminating more information that supports and informs regulatory decisions and patient care once products are approved for use. With these safeguards in place, transparency is a tie that can lift all boats. It can enable stakeholders to better address common challenges in the development process, to identify areas requiring additional post-market research, and to generate the data necessary to meet FDA's gold standard for assuring product safety and efficacy. The FDA's modern transparency strategy began with Dr. Sharstein's leadership at the FDA's Transparency Task Force and subsequent recommendations in 2010. And we continue to expand FDA's commitment to transparency today. But stakeholders continue to request greater transparency in the drug approval process and greater access to usable information on those approvals. And I believe they're right. We, look, we need to look for ways to be more forthcoming with the information we have within the boundaries of our statute and our obligations. Much of our information concerns products that are integral to people's families, the foods they eat, the pets they love, and the medicines they use. People deserve to have as much information about these products as we can possibly reliably provide. And there are more tools available than ever before to help consumers filter this information and to help third parties harness it into more usable knowledge. We have a public health obligation to keep people fully informed of the safety and benefits of the products they use to improve their lives. And we're taking some new steps to fulfill these commitments. Today I'm announcing two important initiatives I hope will provide greater transparency and efficiency in the agency's review of new drug applications and biological license applications. Together, these initiatives will give patients and researchers new insight into the data and decision-making behind the approval process. First, beginning this month, our Center for Drugs, or CEDAR, is launching a pilot to evaluate whether disclosing certain summaries of clinical information called clinical study reports, or CSRs, following the approval of new drug applications can improve the public's access to drug approval information. To start, the pilot's going to include up to nine drug applications whose sponsor is volunteer to participate. The pilot's going to test the process to be run by FDA's drug center for selecting, redacting, and posting CSR information on the public website, Drugs at FDA, that gives FDA, that FDA uses to provide approval information on new drugs. Applications to be included in the pilot will be selected based on criteria including their novelty, scientific interest, and whether or not the drug is a new molecular entity. A CSR is a portion of the drug file related to a clinical trial that contains a detailed summary of bottom line information on the methods and results of the trial. A CSR is a scientific document addressing the efficacy and safety. We expect that making some CSRs publicly available after approval will provide stakeholders with more information on an application's clinical evidence and FDA's decision-making process. It can help those interested in that detailed data, for example, academic researchers who want to study a specific drug and need access to summaries of bottom line information in order to inform that research. This will be the first time that FDA is proactively disclosing clinical summary reports from sponsors to the public. The CSR sections disclosed as part of this pilot will include study, re study report bodies, the study protocol and amendments, and statistical analyses plans for each participating drug product's pivotal study. Clinical summary reports will be posted on a new FDA webpage describing the pilot program, in addition to appearing on drugs at FDA, with the sponsor's drug approval information alongside it at the time that it's approved. One goal of the pilot is to enhance access to clinical information by medical researchers, the drug development community, and the public. While FDA does provide access to drug application action packages that include all discipline reviews after a drug has been approved, their utility 
is sometimes limited by their complexity. While these summaries, these new summaries, provide a window into the basis for our approval decisions, they are packaged in a format that can, at times, make it difficult for external audiences to decipher the key clinical evidence that supported the agency's approval decisions. We believe that by posting key portions of the CSRs publicly in response, we'll both comply with our existing obligations to make certain summary materials publicly available upon approval and make that material significantly more practical and user-friendly for key collaborators. For example, medical researchers who want to further study a specific drug beyond the clinical evidence that's supported its approval and is disclosed typically right now. At the same time, we're taking another new step to make it easier for patients and clinicians to track new therapies as they advance through product development and different regulatory checkpoints. Right now, the majority of publicly and privately supported clinical trials around the world register in the National Institutes of Health database, clinicaltrials.gov, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This website provides easy access to information on studies in a wide range of diseases and conditions. Ultimately, some of these clinical trials involve new drugs and form the basis of an application seeking FDA approval. These trial results are often of great interest to patient research communities. Yet tracking a specific trial in its active state on clinicaltrials.gov to FDA's many activities from advisory committee discussions to approval and subsequent inclusion into a product label can be very challenging at times. In response, we plan to increase transparency around clinical research posted on clinicaltrials.gov by adding the specific identifier number that all clinical trials registered through clinicaltrials.gov will use to link to FDA communications about those specific drugs, including in the product labeling and even our advisory committee materials. This new number will be called a NCT number. Members of the patient and academic and scientific communities can then use this number to follow and track clinical research from a drug's development through key regulatory milestones. This number will make it easier to correlate the clinical trial listings on clinicaltrials.gov to FDA communications about specific drugs, including product labeling and even our advisory committee materials. Including this number on FDA's materials could greatly benefit all those interested in following the progress of specific clinical research. We're also continuing to explore whether it would be possible, as we discussed at the outset, under existing statutory authority or through a change in the governing law, to release additional information from the complete response letters related to the clinical safety and efficacy that could have significant public health value. Releasing all of the CRLs would be administratively challenging, given the likelihood we would continue to redact certain proprietary information from these letters, and not all letters have information that would directly inform clinical practice. For example, many letters primarily relate to manufacturing shortcomings with new drug applications that are eventually resolved. But some of the letters do contain information that could be directly relevant to patients. We're evaluating whether there's a subset of the complete response letters where there are especially important public health reasons to redact and release these letters. This could include letters that have safety-related findings or recommendations that could help inform patients and providers about the profile of already marketed drugs. Releasing inf this information could enhance patient safety by reducing the number of potentially futile trials and spare patients exposure to potential risks without the prospect of a likely benefit. It can also help better inform clinical practice. We're committed to enhancing transparency throughout the work we do at FDA. This is especially true when it comes to these efforts that have the potential to foster further research and discovery across the scientific community and clinical care. And we'll continue to seek additional opportunities to foster greater access to key scientific and information and clarity around regulatory decisions wherever appropriate. The powerful synergy between high quality public health data sets and therapeutic innovation has been evident for more than 50 years, long before the advent of the desktop computer let alone machine learning and genomics. Arguably, two of the most important and impactful public health initiatives undertaken in the post-war era, era were the launch of the Framingham Heart Study in 1948 and the Surgeon General's landmark report on smoking in 1964. The Surgeon General's report was deeply informed by the epidemiologic evidence from the Framingham study, along with a similar cohort in Albany, New York. 
over the ensuing decades subsequent analysis of the original Framingham cohort, and new generations of participants, spouses, and children helped revolutionize our understanding of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including smoking, obesity, and high cholesterol. It led to the development of the Framingham risk score as well. That risk score validated pharmacologic and behavioral interventions that reduced the risk of serious fatal comp complications from heart disease, from the wider use of statin drugs to smoking cessation. The combination of better science and a better informed public led to a dramatic decline in mortality from all forms of cardiovascular disease, including coronary heart disease, stroke, and coronary artery disease. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, or the National Institutes of Health, reports that death, the death rate from cardiovascular disease peaked just before the Surgeon General's 1964 report on smoking and started falling by the late 1960s. From 1968 to 2010, the age-adjusted death rate from cardiovascular disease has declined by nearly 70%. Today, the Framingham study has expanded to include biospecimen banks and the collection of both phenotypic and genomic data, and any researcher can request access to the underlying data sets. Technology, no matter how powerful, is always just a tool. It's our commitment to the transparent, responsible, and science-based use of those tools that gives them their potential to save and improve lives and build many more practical Framingham studies for the 21st century based on a growing number of open source data tools and data sets. To reach their full potential, open data, real world data, and wearable and implantable diagnostics and advanced trial designs will all have to be validated through transparent processes that gain the trust and confidence of all stakeholders in their reliability. And the FDA will be at the epicenter of this process not by inventing new values, but by recommitting ourselves to FDA's century-long commitment to its scientific gold standard for evaluating product safety and effectiveness and remaining the benchmark for global regulatory excellence. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time today. Look forward to your questions. So um, I think people should have index cards. And if you can put questions down um, there and uh, just raise your, raise your hand with them, we'll, we'll collect them. Um, and I'll get them, and we'll be able to uh, ask questions. I'm going to come over and get started. Dr. Gottlieb. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks. That was a terrific uh, talk and did not uh, disappoint with some news about transparency at the agency. Um, I wanted to uh, start with a general question and then uh, follow up with some of the specifics about the announcements that you made. Um, some people think of uh, FDA as a black box, that the agency sits out there in White Oak and makes decisions, and that's really the important thing, how the decisions get made not so important. How, how do you think about uh, what's the metaphor that, that you would like people to think of FDA a, a, as you're leading the agency into a, a very different time? You know, I, look, I think it's, and I think you would agree with this, Josh, I, th I think it's very important that people understand exactly how the decisions get made and, and the processes that inform um, how we go about analyzing data and making decisions and also, you know, the values that inform those decisions because ultimately a lot of a lot of the decisions that we do make are policy calls. I mean, the, you can, you can um, scientifically define the risks and the benefits of, of a product-related decision, but ultimately um, a decision on how you balance those risks against those benefits um, in, involves a lot of policy decision-making. Um, and I think we need to be very transparent and engage the public in how, how we ultimately um, do that balancing. And I, I think we, we do do that. I think we do a good job of that. Um, and it's gotten a lot better over time. I think the advisory committee process provides a lot of transparency. We have hold a lot of public workshops where we engage the public. Um, we try to post online through guidance and other, other vehicles detailed documentation on how we do, uh, do that balancing and make those decisions. And, and, and um, there's more of an impetus, I think, than ever before for the career staff to uh, engage the public as much as possible through speaking opportunities and other kinds of workshop to articulate um, our philosophy. I think ultimately, though, one of the challenges that we face is that 
um, the complexity of what the agency does sometimes makes makes it hard to access. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we struggle with um, historically. And, and that's something that I think we tried to, we're trying to address through, for example, engaging patients more actively in, in the mechanics of the review process, um, trying to elevate um, patient involvement in some of the, uh, the regulatory decision making on the advisory committees. But I, th I think that that's been a historical challenge. Um, I don't think it's just a question of making more information available. I think the issue is, and I think your question is getting at this, how do we sort of make the philosophy and that policy balancing more transparent? Yeah. Um, well, let me um, ask you about uh, the CSR announcement that you just made, the com uh, complete study reports. These are pretty complex documents. They're, right. they're, they're big. They have a lot of data in them. What are the kinds of benefits that you see um, from this pilot program? Well, I think, first of all, it's going to make the review process more efficient. And we're doing it as a pilot program, but we think that over time, a lot of manufacturers are going to see the inherent value in allowing us to make these CSR reports public because a lot of um, the review memos right now are, you know, cutting and pasting from the review documents. And the information, the, re the bottom line clinical information that informs the review isn't very accessible in those documents. I think when, when, we're able to link to the CSRs, the bottom line information in the CSRs is going to make the development of the review document much more efficient, much more accessible, and could provide a lot of efficiency to the review process itself. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the broader reforms that are underway um, with the Office of New Drugs where we're trying to come up with a more consolidated review memo. Right now, if you look at the review process, um, a lot of the documents that are made public at the time of a product approval are different documents related to the different consultative aspects of the review process, so different, different components of the, of the agency um, act as consultants to the review process and write their own memos. So you have multiple memos. Mm -hmm. um, we want to work in the direction of coming up with a more consolidated memo so you have a more team-based approach where everyone's working together and trying to develop a consolidated document that explains the agency's philosophy. So you don't have five different documents. You have one document where, where you can see the consensus and you can see where the disagreement is all in one place. You don't have to go through six different documents to try to figure out you know, who agreed and who disagreed. Now it's all right there in one. And that would be released. That the... would be released at time of approval. It would be just a different way of presenting the information, but having the CSR available, being able to link to it makes it much more um, feasible to come up with a consolidated document. Now, it's also, I mean, just to finish the, the so that's one, that's one virtue of doing it, and that's sort of an efficiency. But then the other is that the CSR is it's one level above patient-specific data. So it's not patient-specific data, but it is more bottom-line data. And these can run hundreds of pages. I think that having it available is going to allow third parties to do more analytics around our decision-making and do more analysis. And so you, you know, you'll have research better informed by actual um, data. Right now, some drug companies release summaries of the CSR, but they don't actually release the whole CSR. So mm -hmm. this would be the whole CSR. So uh, two questions. One, um, should people be worried that patient level data will be uh, disclosed or there'll be uh, approaches to making sure that there's not a confidentiality? Yeah, so the, the, this isn't patient level data. Um, and you know, we're, we're very mindful to make sure, and that's where we're going to have to go through it to make sure that, that um, there's no way to uh, sort of decouple right, the presentation, right? Yeah. I mean, we saw that experiment. I think it was with like AOL, yeah. You know, where they looked at searches and were able to go to people's homes and find out who was doing searches by just you know decoupling the data. Now that that's a concern. Obviously, you want to make sure that the data in in the CSR is presented in a way that um, someone who is an intelligent researcher and has access to other information about a clinical study can't somehow correlate it in a way that they can get down to patient level data. And so um, that's one of the things that we're very focused on. Um, we feel pretty confident uh, that that's not going to be the case. The CSRs are released. I don't know all the specifics around it. Uh, reporters will probably mm -hmm. um, do a better job than me at sort of um, getting, getting at the details of this. But in Europe, the CSRs are available, um, but they're not, they're not readily available. They're available on a um, proprietary database I think that's maintained by the EMA where certain researchers can get access to it. Mm -hmm. So there is some precedent for allowing certain qualified researchers access to some of the CSRs. 
Um, you know, we want to do it on a more wholesale fashion. We're starting it as a pilot. We're working through the legal right. issues. Um, we'll see where it goes. And um, initially, you're starting as a voluntary pilot? It's going to be voluntary. We're, we're going to reach out to companies um, with products that we think um, this could be particularly relevant um, mm -hmm. and can allow for you know, a more efficient process. And then we'll see where it goes. I, I do believe that there's, you know, we, we can talk about whether we end up making this voluntary or, or mandatory going forward. We'll, we'll work that out through the pilot and see You're how it goes. You're guessing what question is on the yeah, answer so, here. Yeah. But, but, I, but, I am, I, but I am making a pitch, and I made it at the outset, for the fact that I think that when, when you look at the, what we're able to do by making the CSR publicly available in terms of how it, how it changes um, the nature of how the review memo gets derived, and that then changes how the review process works, um, I think people are going to see it creates a lot of efficiencies because the the creation of that those reviewer memos and how people formulate their opinions does drive a lot of the structure of how the review process itself works. And to the extent that you can develop a, a more consolidated um, review opinion that more easily surfaces areas of agreement, disagreement, it's all in one document, it lends itself to a more team-based approach, which is the direction we want to move in that I've already talked a lot about. And so in order to move in that, that direction of a team-based review approach where people are part of a consolidated team, the memo itself needs to be a team-based effort. And so that, in theory, that would encourage more uh, manufacturers to participate in we, we think it would We think it's going to create a more efficient review process um, with greater input from people who have, who have expertise in different disciplines who are part of the review process where they're not doing their own consulting memo, but they're part of a consolidated review team. And we think manufacturers are going to recognize that that's a much more efficient development process. I see, and that would encourage them. And would encourage them, yes. Yeah. Um, moving on to the uh, clinical trial number, which is uh, another recommendation that is in the blueprint for transparency. So uh, much, uh, much appreciated. One question there. Um, it has been the case that some uh, uh, researchers sometimes don't register their trial appropriately or don't you know, do the linkages themselves. Um, so obviously there's one aspect of it, which is just getting the information to people so, so they can see um, where there's a trial that has been registered with NIH so that they can look it up. Um, if companies don't do that, if you thought, uh, you know, they don't provide the information, it turns out that, or I don't mean companies, researchers actually, don't, uh, don't tell you which trials they are correctly, or maybe they tell you some and not others. Do you see that this could be an area that lends itself to um, some expectations that FDA has and then enforces on companies? Well, we, you know, we'd have to, um, we're going to see how it goes. Okay. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of creating um, requirements, we'd have to do that through um, some kind of notice and comment process. I, I think we're going to see how this works. Um, and then there's questions of, you know, some of the issues that you're, you're alluding to are things that would be managed by the Library of Medicine, and some right. would be issues that would, we would directly address. Right. What about devices? Do these first two policies have implications for devices, or, or right now you're starting with drugs? Right now we're starting with drugs. I mean, we're, we're doing a similar, we're, we're, I'm not sure what the analogous piece would be to the CSR on the medical device side. It, it's different. But the, um, the broader goals on the medical device side are similar to what we're doing on the drug side in that we're trying to move towards more of a team-based approach mm -hmm. um, in the review process. And, lend, and, and, and to do that, we want to have more consolidated um, types of communications. And so it's easier to, uh, to sort of to read the narrative of what the agency's thinking was. That is a challenge right now when you look at a review package in terms of looking at what the different opinions were, you have to read a lot of different memos. I mean, you've probably done this exercise, yeah, yeah. Um, and and we think that the sort of a more consolidated narrative will lend itself towards more transparency around the agency's considerations. And, and it sounds like what you're saying is that is clearer for people to understand. Still allows room for disagreement uh, in the oh, memo, absolutely, yeah. but allows for the agency to connect to some of the original data in a way that's a little different than now. Right. Instead of just saying, here are five different disparate memos plus three data sets, you're saying, here's the memo, and at the right part of the memo, it'll be referring to data. And so exactly. it's, it's sort of part of a bigger 
uh, approach to reflecting what FDA is saying. Right. Right now, a lot of the, uh, if you look at the memos, they're long, but a lot of it's cutting and pasting of information out of the out of the the uh, package that the sponsors provided, and so it's sometimes it's not very very accessible. If you can provide a memo that that focuses more on the agency's um, thinking and provides linkages to the underlying data because you now have this electronic document mm -hmm. available and that document contains all the data. So you're looking at the agency's analytics and their, their bottom line conclusions and you can sort of correlate right directly to the data where, sure. where need be. That's a more accessible document for, um, for, for lay people because it's more focused on the agency's philosophy and I think it's more accessible for researchers because now they can link back to the, to the detailed data sets that, that were used to, uh, to derive some of the conclusions. Got it. All right. Last couple questions on complete response letters. You knew that would, that would come up. <laughs> um, 2010, a wise person wrote, the public deserves to see the agency's explanations for its decisions. Um, I think that was you. Um, <laughs> and so um, the complete response letters are the letters where uh, FDA explains to a company why it couldn't approve the product. And that may include some proprietary manufacturing issues, but it also may include challenges with the... Uh, um, with the um, safety or effectiveness of the product. And um, there's been some research by FDA showing that while well, companies will release some information about why their drugs weren't approved, for example, they often don't release other information, including some safety concerns. Um, I want, you made a very interesting comment that you're most focused on the public health side of this issue. And so um, can you talk a little bit more about where you see you know, public health uh, coming into play with complete response letters? If, if it, like someone might say, for example, if a drug's never gonna be approved at all, um, you know, why is it necessary to let people know why it failed? What, where's the potential for public health benefit? Um, well, I mean, it, it's hard to draw a conclusion that a drug's never gonna be approved at all. If you look at the, the, the um, statistics, most drugs that make it to the NDA stage right. eventually are approved. I think it's upwards of 90%. You know the statistics as well as I do. Um, but a lot of times the, not a lot of times, but sometimes the basis for the um, decision to issue a complete response will be um, you know, a safety-related issue where the agency is asking for more information about a drug because of a particular concern that it has, where that concern might be relevant to other drugs, similar in drugs in the, in the category, mm -hmm. in the class, um, and that's highly relevant. Um, or, or um, you know, information that can inform different classes of drugs, um, where the agency has sort of an overall philosophy about a therapeutic space or drug-drug interactions, and so those are the kinds of situations where I think that. Uh, making that information um, available to help inform um, clinical practice and public health. I think what we don't want to do, this is, this is very resource intensive, as, as you know. I mean, Peter's been around this issue, you've been around this issue, and, and the challenges have been the, the resource intensive nature of redacting and making these letters public. And, you know, I, don't, I, I want to see if there's a way to make an easy cut, um, and not easy, but something that, that can be implemented as a matter of policy. Um, between letters that have that kind of public health value and, and those that, you know, have less value, might be more interesting to the, you know, investment community, but not right. necessarily have probative value from a public health standpoint. And I'm not sure that, that that's doable. I, I'm um, inclined to think that it might be. We have someone working right now. We've you know, sort of pulled like 100 CRLs. And okay. we have someone w going through them to see whether or not there are some identifiable um, things. So, you know, if you look at a complete response letter, there's sort of above the line issues and below the line issues. Yeah. They're, they're kind of like the kitchen sink. You know, mm -hmm. when you do a complete response letter, they'll have 10 different issues, but there's really only two that are driving, really driving the agency's decision. And so is there a way in terms of how it's organized or certain kinds of information where we can extract it and say letters that have, you know, this at this kind of a safety issue identified in this part of the letter um, or contain this kind of information, we're going to make those public to start. Um, and that's what we're looking at right now. I, I think that there might be a way to, to get there, to find the subset that really is important from a public health standpoint. It might be, you know, places, for example, I'm just speculating, so don't hold me to this, places yeah. where we're asking for an additional clinical trial related to a safety issue for a drug that, where there's 
other marketed drugs that were, could have some relevancy. That, that might be an easily identifiable subset. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things we want to look at. Um, what I don't want to do is become, you know, we have processes in place to make referrals to the SEC when there's misrepresentations yeah. and stuff like that. I don't want to use this kind of initiative where I'm, you know, going to be eating a lot of resources from CEDAR to redact yeah. these documents just for purposes of market efficiency. I, this has to have some bottom line value to patients. So um, two, two last questions. This is uh, really interesting. One more uh, on, on the complete response letters. Um, when we've thought about uh, the public health value of complete response letters, for the, those that are for drugs that are already on the market for unapproved uses have risen pretty high up because you know, sometimes there's a little bit of data out there and, and maybe, you know, some um, intense interest on a company's part for the drug to be used for another indication. Um, but when the chips are down and FDA is really doing its review, they don't see uh, evidence of effectiveness. And, and because that drug is on the market and because there may even be uh, articles in the medical literature saying, hey, why not try this drug for this reason, the FDA's view of that um, uh, could be quite influential, um, you know, coming from the perspective of the FDA is really the, the neutral expert agency that's able to, to decide whether it's a ball or a strike. Um, do you see potential public health value there? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's certainly a category, you know, issues, CRLs related to already marketed drugs. Um, yeah, I, would, I, would, it, I would make two points. I mean, um, in terms of making a cut around that, that's a pretty small subset. Um, so, you know, we might be trying to look a little bro broader than that, and, and um, that information generally is made public. Now, that said, um, there could be a lot of value in doing that, so I'm not by any means saying that I don't think that's a good idea. I'm just, uh, I think we're trying to look a little bit more broadly than that, um, at, a, at a little bit of a broader subset, and a subset, you know, and th that could certainly be scoped into what we do, but a subset also where the information might not diffuse as readily, but for our ability to release the CRLs. And so I, I do want to try to look a little bit more broadly than that, but that could certainly be part of a policy. Great. Um, in, the, in the journal, there's a, a piece by one of your predecessors, uh, Dr. Califf, and where he really lights up on the issue of transparency is uh, the agency correcting misinformation that's out there. You just alluded to that uh, possibility. And, you know, I think he personally was just incredibly frustrated when people would say things that he knew not to be true, and he felt sort of policies or procedures or whatever at the agency made it really hard for, for him to just go out there and go, that's just not the case. Do you feel that kind of frustration? Do you think this is an area where um, the agency may, uh, you know, be willing to, to jump in depending on the... I feel situation. that frustration every day. There's usually about 15 or 20 <laughs> tweets that I craft that uh, that my, my media staff stopped me from sending out. But uh, um, that's a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for the agency because uh, we have to be very careful about the disclosure of information. Um, you know, what, and 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 to appreciate that, in order to do our job, we we get access to a lot of commercial confidential information, trade secret information, and People at the agency take that responsibility very seriously. They take it seriously because there's criminal sanction that attaches to the you know, inadvertent disclosure of trade secret information, but they take it seriously because they know how important it is to be able to do their public health job, to have people feel confident in sharing information with the agency. And so there is a concern that if we demonstrate that we are either you know, not careful in safeguarding the information or will to pursue our own policy prerogatives sort of change our posture easily with respect to, to how we handle information, it could make uh, sponsors more reluctant to disclose information and to fight us on it when we need it. And that, um, you know, that could be a real challenge. And I, I've, we, I come up against that all the time where, you know, so for example, with the shortage situation, you know, we want to disclose more information about what we're seeing in the marketplace and impending shortages, but at the same time, it's manufacturer data, and we need to be careful about disclosing it, or we won't get it as readily. Um, we'll have to fight to get it. Uh, so, so it's a constant, um, it's a constant challenge. I, I know you you've grappled with it as well, but the, the problems with sort of correcting stuff in the market is oftentimes to correct stuff, you have to put out stuff, and sometimes the stuff you're putting out is also confidential information. 
Um, you know, we do make referrals, uh, as you know, um, when it's in the context of, um, you know, securities markets. Yeah. But uh, that that's not the same as trying to correct things in real time on a public health uh, basis. Great. Well, um, thank you so much. I'm just going to make a prediction, which is what you've announced today is going to be very well received. That transparency has a constituency that really cuts across politics. And I think um, you, people can see the, um, you know, or think about what potential barriers are out there. But I think you're going to, and I hope, that it develops its own momentum and that the steps you're announcing today lead to more and your ability to feel more confident about um, doing more things that help people understand the agency, that help um, others develop more effective medical products based on information that the agency has. So uh, congratulations on the steps you're taking today. Thanks so much for, for coming today and for your uh, leadership. At Thanks NCAA. a lot. Thanks for your input. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, so um, I am now going to transition us to the next uh, part of the agenda. Um, thanks to all of you for giving questions. I got through a whole bunch of them here. Um, and we're going to use the index cards uh, for the next uh, session, too. So feel free to uh, write down questions. Um, I'm going to introduce the moderator for the next session, next session, and he is going to introduce the fantastic panels that we have. Our moderator is Dr. Joseph Ross, Associate Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine. He is a member of the Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation at Yale New Haven Health System and co-director of the National Clinical Scholars Program at Yale. He um, is an incredibly a prolific writer and researcher on transparency at FDA and many associated topics, including um, the importance of data for improving clinical practice. Dr. Ross. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's such a testament to Josh to have such an incredible group of people here in this room. And I think we're done, right? I mean, Scott came up. He, he talked about CSRs. Um, so uh, this portion of the meeting, we're going to talk about open data. And the way I like to think about it is uh, more around opportunities, challenges, and implications. Specifically, we're going to be talking about two of the recommendations made in the blueprint. Uh, we're going to be talking about the sort of category two recommendations around uh, that FDA should proactively disclose communications to companies when products are not approved, that FDA should make public its clinical and statistical reviews of products not approved, uh, and FDA should make its pooled data sets, uh, including masked and de-identified, that are masked and de-identified as appropriate, uh, and the FDA's analyses of these data sets. That's category two. We're also going to be discussing the category five recommendations. Uh, and that's more around sort of the bigger picture of open data. FDA should disclose clinical study reports. Uh, and given uh, Scott's announcement, I think for us, the onus now is on sort of how to do that and how to do it in a way that protects uh, patient privacy while ensuring usability and feasibility. Uh, that the FDA should also uh, release the final reports that uh, fulfill post-marketing requirements uh, for, uh, and post-marketing commitments. Uh, and that when there are clinical trial da data, the FDA should uh, take steps to proactively release uh, this IPD. We're going to have three different uh, people speaking today. And I'll introduce each of the three. And then we'll, uh, we'll just have them each take turns coming uh, presenting at the podium. And then we'll sit down and, and we'll take questions. The first uh, speaker is Kate Dickerson. A professor of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she serves as the director for the Center for Clinical Trials and Evidence Synthesis. She's also the director of the U.S. Cochrane Center. Uh, the second is Sean Cody, a statistician in the epi epidemiology branch uh, at, uh, within NHLBI, uh, who runs the BioLink uh, data repository, and he'll talk a little bit about that. And last is Matt Herder, uh, Canadian Harkness uh, Associate uh, Fellow in uh, Healthcare Policy and Practice and the Director of the Health Law Institute at, you know, Matt, how do you say it? Dalhouse? Dalhousie. Dalhousie uh, University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which I'm looking forward uh, to getting a chance to visit this summer. Uh, I've gotten to know Matt over the past years. He's been working with our group at Yale, uh, the CRIT, the Collaboration uh, for Research Integrity and Transparency. So uh, thank you for everyone who's here, and I'll transition to Kay. And 
Thanks very much, Joe, and hello to all of you. Um, and thanks to Dr. Gottlieb for the announcement about the CSR. So my job is to lay in 10 minutes the groundwork for what you'll hear the rest of the day. And I think a lot of what I said was geared to why we need CSRs public. Now you can see just how much information they'll give us. Right. OK. And I'm going to speed through these. Um, the idea was that if the slides are made public, then you all will get to see a story. Uh, and the full story is here, but you may hear me say, and I'm going to skip this slide, and it's because it summarizes a piece of the story. OK, so declaration of interest, the usual things. It's federal grants and PCORI for the most part. OK, so um, most of you are aware of this. You may or may not have seen a slide like this. But the evidence generation piece of what we're talking about, the clinical trials, is what the FDA sees, the clinical trials and some observational studies. Then um, these are made into systematic reviews, where you gather the evidence together and synthesize it qualitatively and quantitatively. Then we make guidelines based on the systematic reviews. And probably the hardest part of all is getting it into practice, which is implementing the best practices. But what we're talking about is evidence generation and getting the full reports of clinical trials. The perspective that my group is coming from is how do we get good systematic reviews that are based on actual data. Uh, but it's also, as we heard from Dr. Gottlieb, what the public can see looking at trials. But either you do it in your head or you do it formally. And I'm talking about doing it formally in systematic reviews. So um, many of you or most of you have seen this in front of the National Academy of Sciences. And it's Einstein. And he said the right for search. Uh, to search for truth also implies a duty. One must not conceal any part of one has recognized to be true. So um, and you're also probably familiar with the Lancet series in 2014 that said we shouldn't raise, waste research data. And I think in the US it was a little offensive at first to hear people talk about waste. But then as we thought about it, no, we shouldn't waste anything. And I'm from the generation that turned ketchup bottles upside down. So I don't waste anything and certainly not research. So if the research has been done, I want to know about it. And I want to know everything so that I don't have to go hunt for it uh, in a difficult spot or whatever. OK, so many of you may not be familiar with um, an, a report that was put out by the National Academy of Sciences labeled the Institute of Medicine until recently when it became the National Academy of Medicine. You're familiar with the 2015 um, report, no doubt, talking about the need for open access to data. But maybe you're not familiar with the 1985 report, which has almost identical recommendations, uh, because you have to be old like me to know that it exists. But We've been making these recommendations a long time about open access to data. And it's just wonderful that we're finally getting there. So thank you very much uh, to the group that's calling us and to FDA for what they're doing. OK, so I'm going to talk about three things that we need um, to make clinical trials uh, better reported. One is, oops, sorry. Um, we have to ask a clear question. And uh, that's harder than it sounds. And what we say is PICO, population intervention or exposure, if you have observational studies, comparator and outcome. You need to know those things. And um, do we know those things? For example, does the systematic reviewer know them? Does the person looking at clinical trial data knowing them? Well, we've, when we've compared publications, what's published, and that's how most of us get our information, to what's in a protocol, they differ. And so we don't really know whether what was planned was what was done, or we're just going after uh, what's easy to report, or the editors of the journal are saying, you can't report all this. And when people have compared protocols to publications, we see the publications don't describe clearly at all what the population is, what the intervention is, what the comparator or the outcome. And um, there's a lot of work that's hidden in this one slide and where we're going from here, uh, and a lot of work that's ongoing. But this is very important. We don't know the basics, the PICO, uh, without looking at, for example, the CSRs. 
But what we get from publications, which is where most of us get our information, it just isn't enough information. So I'm going to give you some information from studies we've done within our group, and many of the group are here today, um, called MUDS. And it's about uh, multiple sources of data, which is what most of us in science deal with. That is, we aren't dealing with just a single source of here's what the data show, either individual participant data or a CSR, but we're dealing with a publication, most of us, and multiple publications or multiple sources of data, including the CSRs. And then what do we do if those data conflict or if something is missing? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our studies, just because there's so many studies out there now that have shown not what MUDS has shown, but little pieces. And MUDS has brought everything together. So in MUDS, we looked at gabapentin for neuropathic pain. And that's not an FDA-approved use. So it's what's called an off-label use. And catiapin for bipolar disorder, which is allowed um, by the FDA, but under a different mechanism. OK, so we're looking at just two cases. We're not looking at everything that's out there. And in MUDS, we found 21 trials. I'm just going to show you the um, results that are relevant to what I'm saying for gabapentin. I'm not going to go into catiapin. But for gabapentin, for neuropathic pain, we found 21 trials um, where the question was, remember the question was the first thing we had to do, uh, is gabapentin effective in relieving neuropathic pain? And we found 21 trials, and these were reported in 80 sources. So the person who's trying to tie all this information together, whether it's the public or whether it's a scientist doing a systematic review, has to find 80 sources. And that's not easy. But anyway, of these 80, 68 were public and 12 were not public. That meant either you couldn't find them or you had to go. In our case, we found um, non-public sources, not for everything, but for a few of the trials because there had been litigation and we found them online. And so um, we were able to compare what's non-public with what's public and see all the information for these trials. So looking at PICO, what we found is What's green or blue there is it wasn't clear. It's not that it was it disagreed between the non-public and the public sources. That's in red. Um, but what's in green is it just wasn't there some of the time. And so we had to look in multiple sources, including non-public sources, to be able to find what the PICO is. And the, the bottom line on, based on what we heard from Dr. Gottlieb today is, wow, the CSRs are going to tell us a lot. What's blue there, if it becomes public, can now become something that we all go to first to try to find out what the PICO is. That information is there. It's just you have to look in these non-public sources. And if they're public, he's going to do a pilot first. But if all the CSRs are public, then we should be able to find out what PICO is. So this is a study some of you um, may be familiar with also on the gabapentin for neuropathic pain and other outcomes done by Swarup Badula. And it's putting all of it in one slide. I'll see how that works. The red spots are what was reported, uh, sorry, what's reported in the CSR. And then the blue spots are what's reported in the publication, the outcomes. And so what's in the CSR is not statistically significant. It's above that 0.05 line. And yet different outcomes then were mentioned in the publication than were mentioned in the CSR. And this is confusing. The ones that were mentioned in the publication were statistically significant. The ones that were in the protocol, designated in the protocol, is the ones they wanted to look at. Uh, are in the CSR. So in the CSR, if it's made public, we're now going to be able to see all the outcomes that were examined and not just the statistically significant ones or predominantly the statistically significant ones. So that's outcome. Oh, PICO. OK. Um, so we suggest some standards. And I'm not going to go through these because they would just take me too much time. But it will tell you the whole story, that is, that um, PICO is not clearly described, or it's not what was in the protocol. And you may not be able to put the data from what's published into a meta-analysis. But it's there. It's in the CSR. So if we make the CSR public, 
uh, this should be good. And the data are already aggregated there. With an individual participant data, the data aren't already aggregated. You would have to do it yourself. And we do have some ways of getting access to that, including Yoda. So this is risk of bias. And this is a complicated graph. And if you're interested in it, you can go to the original publication. Evan Mayo Wilson, who's in the audience, is the first author. And what this tells you is, for each of the trials um, that of the 20 trials that I mentioned, um, we're going to assess, are these good trials? What's the risk of bias? And so for each trial, sometimes there was only one publication. That's where there's a dot and where down below, I use this pointer, but there are multiple uh, screens. So sometimes there's only one publication or report, and sometimes there are lots of them, like that one out on the far uh, right, Sang 2013. And what you see is on the inner uh, circle, you see if you only looked at one, what's the worst case situation, and on the outer is can you find out what you need to find out about the risk of bias? And the answer is yes, you can. You just need what was non-public to be made public. So the information is there. Here it is for all the risk of bias items. The information is there. It's just hidden right now. It's in non-public information like CSRs. The one exception to that is missing data. And so um, we need to deal with how missing data are handled to be able to understand because people, and this is statistical for some of you, um, it, 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 there are different ways of handling missing data that are sometimes not highly regarded. So finally, we need to meta bias. We need to minimize meta bias in the systematic review. And this shows that using our data from MUDs um, and uh, Tianjing Li has a paper on this um, that has been submitted at least, least and uh, it's also in Ed Mayo Wilson's paper, that you can get anything from, yes, there was a statistically significant result of using this drug, to no, there was not a statistically significant result for the same outcome. That's shown all sources up there, the purple, and because the outer confidence limits for the outer tails uh, don't cross over, you can get different results using simulation depending on um, which data source you use. And this is kind of scary. You can see the FDA source here is the most positive about um, the outcomes, what we found. We only had two studies where we had FDA data. So, um, but the scary part here that we all should notice is that depending on the source you use, um, you can get different results for the same outcome. Okay, and so finally, uh, making the individual participant data, the CSRs, and the pooled data sets and final research reports public um, will improve patient care. That's that bottom line, that's the graph I showed you to begin with. It'll tell us more about the methods, the risk of bias, and the results. And hopefully, I've convinced you of that. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I, too, would like to express my thanks to everybody, for, especially the Pew and, and to Joe for Take off the tag, okay. <laughs> I could it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what I came to talk about briefly was how our institute has made uh, data from institute-supported clinical studies widely available uh, to the general scientific community. Um, I'm in the Division of Cardiovascular Sciences at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And basically to give you kind of a, a 50,000-foot view of how we started, uh, back in 1999, the Institute wanted to have a more formal approach to data sharing. And so some of the staff got together. We put together a protocol. Um, it was approved by the NHOBI IRB. And roughly in the year 2000, our first kind of website opened up. And that um, IRB protocol continues to this day. Uh, so the purpose, the reason we wanted to make data more widely available was in order to take full advantage of institute-supported clinical studies. 
And the, the best way um, we felt to do that was to make the data as widely available as possible under appropriate terms and conditions to the largest possible audience. Um, so in, in order to kind of fulfill that purpose, we had to consider essentially multiple stakeholders. And of course, study participants being first and foremost. Uh, so uh, study participants is not true so much in the clinical trials, but the observational studies often have tiered consents. And so the, uh, when we share that data, we need to make sure that we're taking the informed consent restrictions into account. Uh, we also want to be sure that we're taking any confidentiality and privacy concerns into account, but also respecting participants' altruism and, and participating in clinical research. Um, of course, also study investigators. Study investigators have a considerable investment in, in time and, and also their intellectual input in the design, implementation, and conduct of a study. Uh, the scientific community making data reasonably uh, accessible in a reasonable amount of time. And of course, the public, since it is the public dollars that, that, um, that have been invested in this clinical research. Okay, so all these are, are somewhat intertwined. I'm going to try to hit kind of upon each of them in turn, but just keeping in mind that um, they are essentially all linked together in one way or another. So for preparers, for the study investigators, when they're preparing data for submission to the data repository, you know, first and foremost is you want uh, as much documentation as you can get, as carefully prepared as you can get. So the clinical forms, the manual procedures, protocols, uh, a publications list, other relevant documentation such as algorithms for calculated variables, just full descriptions of the data. Uh, the expectation is, is that all the data that was collected during the con conduct of the study will be made available. Uh, that includes things like procedural tests, uh, you know, things like ECHO, CTs, uh, questionnaire data, the outcome data. Um, of course, the data should be prepared in a manner consistent with the informed consent. So due to tiered consents, it, there could be situations where there's essentially multiple, I don't want to say versions of the data, but the data set then subsetted to participants uh, consistent with that informed consent. For example, commercial entities would get uh, a data set that's been appropriately subsetted to those who gave consent for commercial use. And again, there may be research use restrictions such as only hemochromatosis type of studies can use this data or any type of research. Uh, so we need to make sure we take those in consideration. So of course, obvious identifiers are removed. And from there, HIPAA is the primary guideline for removing the obvious identifiers. Uh, we do recode all dates as a time interval. So uh, the date of randomization may be day zero, and then all other dates are relevant to that um, date of randomization. Geography is generally removed, not always, but if you have a study with hundreds of clinical sites, you may not be particularly concerned. You just give them a random kind of uh, site identifier. Um, if you just have just a few sites, uh, then you might want to be a little bit more careful about geography. Sensitive data is removed when not integral to the study. We have, for example, a, a large population-based study. It collected data, they were young adults when they were enrolled, and so there is some data on things such as drug use, uh, incarceration history. That, since it's a general population study, that would be withheld um, and not part of the widely accessible data. Um, other data may be recoded to minimize the possibility of any sort of re-identification. And there we're talking about putting into reasonable groups things such as race, ethnicity, uh, marital status, education, income, things that we would refer to as kind of casual knowledge type of traits that we do uh, group together. Also, free text fields are always a concern. Oftentimes, you see names or dates or you know, precise hospital names, things like that. So we pay particular attention to free text fields. OK, so for the timing for release. So for our trials, um, the guidelines are that three years after the final visit of the participant to their clinical trial site or two years after publication of the primary outcome paper, the idea is that data then becomes widely available to the general research community. 
And similarly, for observational studies, three years after the completion of an examination cycle or a follow-up cycle, or once, um, or two years after a baseline, uh, of, uh, that baseline data, the follow-up data, the outcome data, once it's been finalized and ready for release uh, to the study investigators, then the idea is it becomes generally available to the general scientific community. So the intent really is that study investigators have this two-year protected period of time. Now, during that two years period, that doesn't mean data is not being shared. Almost all of our investigators are open to collaborations and things like that. It's just that that data sharing is occurring through internal study-based procedures rather than being widely open to anybody who really requests it. So the data access process. We do have a website. Um, the first step is to register on the website, fairly straightforward. There's this data request sheet that asks for fairly simple information about um, the data set you're requesting and, and some of the things you want to look at in terms of that data set. We do require either an IRB approval or a certification of exemption from IRB review. Uh, we do conduct what's known as a, just an administrative uh, review of the data access request. Basically, all we're looking at is to make sure that what you want to do with the data is consistent with the terms and conditions of the data use agreement. And so within that data use agreement, there is a there's, it's prohibited to share the data with another third party. Um, you are limited to three years, but after three years, you just either renew or you tell us that you've destroyed the data. It does uh, have an acknowledgment uh, for publications. And if you do significantly change your project or you want to add project, we just ask that you let us know about it. Again, just for kind of an administrative level review type situation. And then on the data use agreement, institutional sign off is required along with the investigator sign off. Okay, so one, th one thing I thought I'd do, so we have all this, and I just thought I'd give you just a quick rundown of perhaps some of the outcomes from our data sharing activities. So since we are the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, you can kind of see the type of studies here uh, that, that's part of our portfolio of studies. Right now we have 42 observational studies available and 122 trials, um, so almost 800,000 participants represented at present. So you can see cardiovascular, um, heart failure, asthma, um, sickle cell disease, the, what you'd expect from a heart, lung, and blood institute. Uh, this is essentially cumulative access requests for data. And the take home uh, message that I wanted to do with this slide, that red line is cumulative requests for observational data. And the blue line is for trial-based data. And kind of the, the message here is that while observational studies have kind of dominated the data access request process, you can notice that that difference has narrowed quite a bit. There's been a, a, a considerable uptake in demand for trial data for secondary use. Um, here, what we're looking at is kind of the variety of uses that our data ends up getting used for. So of course, new uh, hypothesis generating questions is, is the most popular. Uh, but along with it, people ask for our data for meta-analyses, both with our data and other data that they've acquired, uh, statistical methods, types of research, what I kind of call clinical trial methods, things looking at trial design um, or different aspects of analysis of, of clinical trials, uh, a comparison group. Um, for instance, one of our population studies was a comparison group to a study of NFL players. Uh, a, a clinical prediction, it can. That's been a more recent, that's uh, that, that uh, top kind of blue bar up there. Very recently, clinical prediction models, risk prediction has, has our data has been used a lot for that of, uh, of recent. And then other reasons, pilot data for grant submission, simulation studies, things like that. Uh, publications, you know, this is probably the primary uh, metric for us in terms of the value that we get from releasing data, making it widely available. We have presently 872 publications, and you can kind of see the steady rise in, in the publications. Of course, as more data becomes available, and as the request goes. Um, that's all. Oh, I, sh I should summarize. All right, so um, demand from, for secondary use continues to steadily increase. 
Um, we grow each and every year. Um, clinical trial and observational data from, from repositories, they fulfill a range of needs. It's not, just, uh, it's not just to replicate, it's not just for new questions. There's a range of needs that, are, that, that repository data can fulfill. A review for de-identification usability and post-request support are non-trivial tests. The, once you make that data widely available, there is an expectation that you're going to support it. And so these activities do uh, occupy a considerable amount of time. Um, just to kind of give a brief uh, over, uh, overview of the type of level of effort, um, and this is mainly on our contractor side, but so the web platform, the maintenance, about two and a, uh, almost two and a half FTEs, analytic support. Uh, I didn't talk about our biospecimen side, um, but the biospecimen, uh, the biorepository requires um, a significant level of, of effort as well, along with communication efforts and then the, the total management. And that was all I had. So thank you to the organizers for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so after hearing a fair bit about the why and the how, my task is to tackle the question of what it will mean from a regulatory point of view for the FDA to increase its institutional openness. And by openness, I mean greater openness in the FDA's decision making as well as the data behind its decisions. Recommendations 8 through 10 and 16 through 18 of the blueprint articulate concrete ways in which to improve transparency of the FDA's decision making. Specifically, the blueprint calls upon the FDA to publish not only its decision to approve drugs and its underlying action pack packages, but also applications that have been rejected, withdrawn, or abandoned, which I'll refer to collectively as negative decisions. And the blueprint also calls upon the FDA to publish a great deal of the data underlying those decisions, positive or negative, including pooled data sets, CSRs, and in some circumstances, individual patient level data. Separate, separate from the benefits of patient safety and innovation efficiency that we've heard a little bit about already, publishing a more fulsome set of data and, the dis and decisions um, will also afford uh, three important benefits to the institution of the FDA. So the first institutional reason for greater openness concerns institutional memory and agency discretion. The second surrounds regulatory harmonization. And the third reason is one of good governance. So I'll develop each of those in turn, and I'll start with institutional memory. It has become received wisdom within the FDA that certain information, including negative decisions and non-summary data, cannot be disclosed because it constitutes commercial confidential information. This obscures a much more nuanced history within the FDA itself about what information it has chosen to disclose at different points in time. And it also obscures flexibilities that legal scholars outside the FDA have repeatedly suggested could be invoked in the absence of legislative reform to improve transparency at the FDA. At times, the FDA has agitated for and successfully exercised its discretion in the direction of transparency. The remarks of former Commissioner Donald Kennedy emphasizing a democratic rationale for transparency in the late 1970s are often cited. The efforts of various FDA officials, some of whom, like Robert, Robert Temple, who are still at the FDA today, to push for public disclosure of what was referred to in the late 1970s as the two-inch, two-foot, and 20-foot data reports should be known more widely. But even before those initiatives in 1972, the FDA had authored a set of public information regulations under the Freedom of Information Act which allowed public disclosure of the safety and effectiveness data behind drug applications that were rejected, abandoned, or withdrawn unless, quote, extraordinary circumstances were shown. In other words, as early as 1972, the agency proposed and briefly implemented a practice of disclosing safety and effectiveness data underlying the very sorts of negative decisions that the authors of the blueprint are calling for today. As well, in 1974, the FDA announced its intention to publish summaries of safety and effectiveness data behind drugs it approved, even though a statu statutory authority to do so was not codified until the passage of the Hatch-Waxman Act in 1984. 
On its face, Section 104 of that legislation also imported the agency's interpretation of the FOIA law, but widening it to include not only the safety and effectiveness of data behind rejected, withdrawn, or abandoned marketing applications, but also approved ones as well. Then Congressman Henry Waxman sponsored the addition of the disclosure provision to the bill. After it was passed in the House, however, then Commissioner of the FDA, Frank Young, wrote to Senator Hatch advising that the FDA would consider that the extraordinary circumstances test would have been met provided the sponsor demonstrated the data had ongoing commercial value. The fundamental point here is less about where the FDA ended up and more about the discretion that the agency continuously exercised about what is and what is not CCI. Court decisions through the 1980s and beyond constrain that discretion, but so too has the agency gained a statutory mandate from Congress to disclose safety alerts, warning letters, links to clinical trial registrations and results, as well as, quote, other materials deemed relevant by the FDA to the question of drug safety. Implementing the Blueprint's recommendations would serve as a critically important reminder of the discretion that the FDA continues to enjoy about what information it can and cannot share, and to correct the problem which is, to some extent, a problem of its own making. The second institutional reason to improve the transparency of FDA's decisions and data concerns regulatory harmonization. For years, regulators have espoused this goal of harmonizing policies and procedures, resulting most notably for today's purposes in the creation of a common approach to the formatting of drug submissions. Apart from the pilot that we heard about this morning, insofar as the FDA continues to withhold negative decisions and non-summary level data, including CSRs, and individual patient level data from public purview, the US regulator is apt to be out of step with other jurisdictions. The European Medicines Agency is already proactively publishing CSRs, and other regulators are following suit. Health Canada, for instance, has introduced regulations into Canada's parliament, which if passed would require publication of safety and effectiveness data behind all approved, rejected, or withdrawn drugs unless the data was not actually relied upon during the review process, or the data in question is deemed a method or assay which is exclusively used by the sponsor in question. If these jurisdictions succeed in enacting these new disclosure regimes, the FDA's policy of non-disclosure will put patients, physicians, researchers, and companies at a relative disadvantage in terms of what they can learn about the FDA's decision making compared to foreign regulators. Further, if the FDA chooses to go its own way and maintain the confidentiality of negative decisions and non-summary data, it may soon find itself forced to disclose information in response to regulatory decisions outside the United States. That is because the legal category of commercial confidential information does not extend to information already in the public domain. As the EMA and Health Canada render regulatory decisions and publish the underlying data, the FDA may face an increase in requests under FOIA legislation for information which, by virtue of its availability from foreign regulators, can be CCI no more. In this sense, the FDA would not only be out of step with its regulatory partners, but risk losing a level of control over its own processes, in particular about the timing of disclosure. Which takes me to my third and final reason for improving the transparency of FDA decision making, good governance. Much has been said about the potential to better inform actors, patients, physicians, researchers, and industry outside the FDA were the transparency of its decisions to improve. If the FDA really is unique in the analyzable data sets it secures from industry, then the benefits to pharmaceutical knowledge production and patient safety can hardly be understated. However, the benefits of opening up the FDA's decision making to public scrutiny are not one directional nor purely instrumental. Rather, there are benefits to be gained from within in terms of the decision-making performance of the agency itself and in terms of the larger public function the agency serves. As Daniel Carpenter puts it, access to the FDA's decisions and the reasons that underpin them, not just the data, are important for patients and researchers, but also citizens. Studies comparing the outcomes of the FDA and the EMA reviews of the same drugs based ostensibly on the same data vaguely allude to the fact that economic, political, and social cultural factors may account for any observed discrepancies between the two regulatory outcomes. And a cadre of social scientists who have closely ob observed the FDA and other regulators from within have done well to explain what those factors look like in a series of cases. 
These studies and the openness of public advisory committee hearings provide only a glimpse of the full complexity, contingency, and contested nature of regulatory decision making. Adopting the Blueprint's recommendations and perhaps going even further, not simply disclosing the data, but rather providing the full sets of, of reasons for a decision. For example, how it's been informed by past reviews in the same class of drugs would represent a remarkable expression of the FDA's commitment to good governance. I imagine that that level of openness might sit uneasily with some regulatory officials, but the FDA only ever exists in controversy. And at a time when public agencies are under significant threat, revealing the full complexity of the FDA's decision making rather than hiding it may help preserve its legitimacy as an institution. Thanks very much. A bit of time for questions. So every, anyone who has uh, questions they want to put down on the on the index cards, pass them forward, and uh, I'll, I'll get us started. Um, just thank everybody, the three panelists, for for getting us started on a great great discussion. I think that um, while people are passing it in questions, I think it'd be useful for us to to start with the issues around sort of usability and feasibility uh, when we think about open data. There's a, an interesting, there's a, there's a number of moving parts. Um, you know, when, when Sean, when you, when you spoke, you talked about the, the work that's done to de-identify the data and prepare it. That's mostly around the, the issue of uh, distributing IPD, not the clinical study reports. But if we focus on the clinical study reports, you can imagine that the, the efforts that are needed to privatize or make sure that there's no patient information in the CSR are actually more difficult than in a, in a flat data set um, where it's easier to sort of to aggregate up and to, to strip identifiers uh, in whole as opposed to page by page. So what I'm, and at the same time, uh, Peter Doshi and Tom Jefferson and comments within uh, on the Blueprint report that were published uh, in, in concert with the, with the Blueprint in the, in the journal uh, talked about the need for uh, easier access and in terms of the whether you need to have an application to, to apply for, for the CSR as opposed to IPD. And Dr. Gottlieb himself talked about just posting them uh, you know, just on drugs at FDA where anyone can download them. So I guess the question that I'd like to hear the panel reflect on a little bit is how to balance the, these feasibility, usability issues in concert with the work we know that's going to be going on uh, to de-identify CSRs for proactive distribution by the EMA. How do we make sure that the CSRs that are made available can be used? And what kind of a, a pathway for access do you envision as the best? And, and I, I think ideally what Dr. Gottlieb proposed, which is bold, would, would be best for science. But maybe, maybe you guys could sort of just talk about that uh, one by one. Uh, you and I have talked about this. I think CSRs are hard to use. But because they're aggregated data, I think, in a way, they're easier to use than the individual participant data. Um, one of the reasons they're difficult is because they have everything, everything in it, and uh, in multiple places. And so, let's say two people do the data extraction in an 8,000-page document, they might actually extract different information. So. I think, as uh, Dr. Gottlieb was saying, having an electronic document with pins or pointers might help us quite a bit. And maybe the whole electronic uh, nature of things can make this more doable. But it's definitely something we have to pay attention to. I, you know, I'd, I'd have to say I would concur. Um, as, a, as an NIH institute, you know, we fund primarily academic uh, type of trials. So it's a, it's a little difficult for me to relate. Um, you know, some of the things that, that we do uh, involve not only checking for obvious things with the data, but we'll also have to, because of the usability side of it, is we basically have to check all the data and compare it to all of the documentation. And that's what's kind of the heavy burden um, part of, of our 
review process. Um, but so some of those things in, in a way relate, but I do think that there are, I think there are technology types of um, approaches that, that could probably help tremendously. I guess the only point I would add, and I'm a legal scholar, so I think, or I'm less able to think about uh, usability from a, a research uh, of the data perspective, are the institutional considerations about when exactly to disclose um, and what kinds of processes need to be in place or not uh, when the regulator is trying to make that decision. I find just, uh, you know, I know I'm raising a little bit of ancient history, but I think it's useful as a reminder because some of these sort of very detailed questions on the how side have been have been thought about in the past. And it's interesting that even though it seems to be lost in the present policy discussion, that the debates in the 70s around releasing way more data, one of the strongest recommendations that came out of this independent uh, panel of drug regulations is that we should release this information not, um, not when decisions are made, but actually during the regulatory review process. So, and that doesn't even seem to be a question right now. Everyone's talking about after decisions are final in some way. So the question of timing, I think, actually could be worthy of some further thinking, although everyone's taking it for granted that we'll wait till an actual decision is made, as opposed to actually engaging independent researchers more actively in the review process. Um, I think that's something that we could think about more. Um, and I'd be curious what clinical researchers think about that. The, the other point is, is around these exceptions and redactions. And there are obvious resources constraints that we need to think through. But the wording of some of the exceptions that are being put into place about information that will be withheld um, I, is quite controversial, and I'm not sure that we've come up with good language as yet. So I, I alluded to the Canadian policy developments. And there, the thinking is two exceptions to the disclosure following a re regulatory decision. Um, and those are information that is not actually relied upon, but is somehow being exchanged by the sponsor with uh, the regulator. And secondly, methods assays, other kinds of sort of um, information that is more procedural in, in nature, um, which is in, quote, the exclusive possession or use of the sponsor in question. And I worry with the latter exception that that, that potential, that has a potential to be quite wide, and the regulator may not have the capacity to screen for whether it's exclusively used or not. So I think more work needs to be done when we think about the idolized model, about the wording of the ex exceptions to disclosure following a decision. Uh, I'm just going to read this question that came in for Matt, which, uh, which may enable you to just give us a little bit more background on the Canadian policy. Because someone is asking, can you provide us with additional information on the effects, if any, thus far from Health Canada's regulatory decision around open data? Sure. So uh, it's a decision that is very much still in process. Um, so Health Canada passed major amendments to the Food and Drugs Act in 2014, and there were a variety of provisions around transparency in that legislation. Um, one of them included, and this is where I think, as a matter of law, the Canadian approach may be more on stronger footing than the European one. Um, and that is because there's an explicit power in Health Canada's governing statute to uh, revise and change what the scope of proprietary information is. So that was added to the law. It, at the time, it introduced a broad definition of we call it co confidential business information, uh, which basically codified Health Canada's longstanding practice of treating unpublished safety and effectiveness data as confidential business information. But it included a regulation-making power to change that definition or to pull specific kinds of information outside that category. And so it introduced in mid-December regulations that actually would do that, use that power to say, it, once a decision is made, information which we have treated as CCI or in Canadian terms CBI, we are going to call it clinical information and release it. Um, and so uh, with those two exceptions that I've mentioned. Um, so those regulations are open for public consultation. Uh, uh, including to folks outside of Canada. Um, and after that, the, the Health Canada has announced it will actually produce a guidance further interpreting it. And we think they're going to look like what the EMA has done. But the EMA has largely done what it's done as a matter of policy as opposed to governing law, in my view. So I, I think the Canadian approach is actually on stronger legal footing. So I'm going to ask a question. <clears throat> what, what I, was, I was struck by, um, in Sean's slides, the, the vast uptake in use of the, of the shared data over time. 
and the, the sort of low, uh, the low usage initially that's sort of you know, certainly grown exponentially. And that's an experience that we've had working on the Yoda project and sharing data in that way as well. And I, contrasting that with, you know, this blueprint is really about sort of forward thinking going forward, sort of what can we do to make the regulatory world, public health world better, more informed going forward. Yet when Kay, your, when your presentation, the vast majority of the work that you're describing is about gabapentin, a drug that's been on the market for 25 years, but remains one of the most commonly used today. How do we think about um, retroactively applying some of these recommendations? You know, how do we think about, you know, these drugs that are in wide use where the likelihood of CCI is probably substantially diminished around both the IPD and, and the CSR. I'm so glad you brought that up because there's so many drugs that are in current use and are highly used, like gabapentin, and that's off-label use, so we haven't even gone there. <laughs> um, and how are we going to get the data? So we could go, and, and that uh, 2015 data sharing recommendation from the IOM recommends starting, I think, 2007, anyway, recently. And, uh, but there are many, many drugs we use that were approved before that. I think some of this stuff can be released, and it's there. Um, and maybe we should just release what we can. And do you uh, think that there's a, um, there's a group, there, that the, there's medical researchers who are going to take advantage of it. That, that's always the question, right? Like in the slow uptake. Like Systematic the, reviewers will, absolutely. But again, we have to deal with this wading our way through the CSRs, which can be a big job. And I don't know that electronically they're set up right now. One of the things I was going to bring up when we were having the discussion, and maybe it's just my naivete, but do we know how CSRs are put together? And um, my understanding is that it's multiple people at industry, at a company, are putting it together. And maybe if we modify how they're put together, they can be easier to wade through and, and less duplication of effort. I, I, it's a great question. Um, I'd probably have to ask a question first. So are, in terms of what gets released as a, as, with the CSRs, would that be prepared by uh, industry, or would that is that something that FDA is going to do? I think it's a good question. I would expect it will be prepared by the sponsors as part of the submission process, but FDA would probably have a close hand in ensuring that it's appropriately de-identified. So, you know, one of the issues that we have Still with me, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the issues that we have with uh, you know these academic trials and studies done by a lot of different you know, academic users, uh, units is that uh, there can be a lack of consistency in the way they're prepared. And I think that's, that's one of our kind of hurdles is to try to get more consistency, but you've got to maintain that flexibility too in the way that data is prepared. Um, so if some of those could be done more centrally, then probably, then, you know, I'm just kind of in a way talking off the top of my head just from, just from, from our background. Um, then some of the legacy types of, of, of CSRs, you know, that might be the way uh, to, get, to get those released. Mm -hmm. But it would probably have to be targeted. Uh, and I'm not sure how you would try to set your priorities on, on, on targeting those. So I would just add a wrinkle there is that you know, uh, consistency in the name of usability seems like a good thing, but it's um, if we're standardizing, the, the question of standardizing to what is, becomes quite critical because, you know, if we think about multiple jurisdictions with different sort of definitions of what's proprietary, what's not, how far you need to go in terms of de-identifying the data in light of privacy concerns, there's a concern also that if we make it easier so, such that industry formats this one time for multiple submissions for public disclosure eventually that the sort of greatest protection of privacy, for example, in Europe, which I understand to have to be stronger as a matter of law than in Canada or the United States, for example, is going to make the use of compromise the ultimate usability of those documents. And I don't think it's hard to imagine the highest standard in terms of protecting privacy and the largest scope of what's proprietary and what's not doing a lot of work in the process of coming up with one common submission. So 
Admittedly, there are efficiency concerns about having to do this multiple times, but there's also a trade-off with which standard is going to undermine the usability of those documents as well. Yeah, we've been doing our data repository for 20 years, and we, we, we can't come up with one. Right. You know, because we're up against NIH policy and, and you know, our own policy and then people's own perceptions and things like that. It's hard. Yeah. Well, what strikes me with that comment is, um, on the one hand, in your comments, you talked about how uh, as Canada and the, and the EU get, get ahead in terms of what they're releasing with respect to CCI, uh, it can you know, undermine the sort of argument for retaining information within FDA. But on the other hand, if they're not re re releasing certain patient identifiable information that makes these documents usable, the FDA may actually get out ahead of them in terms yep. of their, which yep. sets a, they're going sort of in slightly different directions, but, although both are moving towards greater transparency. Yeah, it's quite dynamic, you know, as to which regulator is going to lift or pull others up or down. You know. But don't we have reporting standards for papers, and then each journal says, yes, and we also want this or whatever, like ICMG asks for registration by a certain date, which is, you know, a fine tuning. Uh, and then they either endorse or implement the reporting standards, and it hasn't actually worked that well. Um, but I think that if we have reporting standards, we can certainly have standards for the CSRs. Well, so I'll just note that having participated in some of the discussions on the European side, there is a real need for standard setting, particularly from statistical associations around appropriate you know, de-identification and what needs to be taken out, as opposed to the HIPAA standards that FDA right. generally uses. The, the European Union is, you know, is pushing much farther, hmm. which has the sort of risk of making the, dender, the, the, the data unuseful. Sean, I wonder if you could speak to something. So you know, when, um, one of the biggest concerns uh, when you start talking about making data more available uh, around both among medical product industry and clinical researchers is that people won't want to participate in trials because they're concerned that their data is going to now be made available. Um, and this came in as a question. Um, you know, what was your, your experience or the experience of NHLBI uh, when it put this policy forward, started making the data available? How did, how did it affect clinical trial enrollment? How did it affect uh, you know, clinical investigators applying to use NHLBI funds knowing that they were now going to have to make their data available? Okay, that's a, another great question. So in the, in the beginning, there was um, resistance. Um, I think from, from, um, from both the observational studies and, and the trialists. Uh, probably the observational study people were a little bit more open because by design, you know, an observational study is meant to generate many questions, you know. Um, but everybody wanted to make sure they had that opportunity to ask the questions they really wanted to. Um, <clears throat> and I think observational study folks kind of caught on a little quicker. Um, probably the clinical trials now are about where the observational study people were, you know, as they started to get, um, to, to get, to, to be more open. Um, from, from the trialist perspective, a lot of it has to do with uh, understanding the nuance of the data. And uh, the trialists who put so much effort in, into that study um, feel that they're in the best position to analyze it. And you know, we can understand that. That's why we do have in a, you know, a, a two-year protected period of time. Given the whole push with the institute, well, um, the, the medical journal editor's report, the IOM report, and even uh, with clinicaltrials.gov, I think the trials are now at the point where uh, they understand the need for open sharing. Um, but again, the, the hows are, are still, I think, a problem. You know, being a funder, um, if you offer the money, they will take it, you know. So um, the, the general approach is, you know, there are, there are the bigger studies where we can get this in the notice of award. And, you know, they will do it, you know, especially if that's what you do to get the money. It does seem like we need to really have a better way of rewarding sharing. And I don't think um, we have that yet. And I, don't, I haven't really heard anything that um, would really jump that, I think, to, to kind of the next level to reward the sharing that investigators do. 
Um, so I just got the wrap-up note from oh. Josh, but I wanted to thank our panelists. I wanted to thank Josh for bringing it together. I wanted to thank Alan for having Pew host us. Um, thank you, and we'll thank you. keep thank going. You. Thank you. Well, wow, thank you very much. That was really terrific and really right on point to have an announcement about um, the study reports being made available and then have such an incredibly informed discussion about the utility of those very reports um, and some of the challenges, strengths, and weaknesses of those reports to really advance medical science right afterwards was terrific. So um, uh, thanks so much, and thanks uh, to Dr. Ross for, for moderating. Um, I also wanted to um, specifically thank Mike, Mike Stebbins for his work with the Arnold Foundation pulling, uh, getting this whole project together, and to thank C-SPAN 3 for being here and broadcasting. Um, made me think, uh, as I was listening to these presentations, you know, if somebody is just clicking around, doesn't know all the acronyms, lands on this discussion, what is it about? How does it affect them? And in fact, Transparency at FDA has just a huge impact um, on uh, many different uh, uh, people. And I'll give some examples. I think patients may want to know uh, what happens to promising products. They've heard about it. There's something in development. Uh, did, it, is it, did it get approved? Does it work? If it didn't get approved, why not? Those are pretty basic questions that if you or someone you love um, is suffering from a disease, you want an answer to. Um, doctors care a lot about transparency. I don't know if this is going to be playing in any waiting rooms, but the um, uh, physicians uh, can learn a lot from the data. And we, we talked about that. You heard this on the previous panel about whether drugs actually work for certain uh, topics, for certain populations. Uh, of patients, and uh, the data we're talking about can really extend what's in the published literature and really help inform clinical practice. Researchers can learn uh, about uh, development pathways that don't make sense, or as Dr. Gottlieb said, some findings that, it, that, that are, uh, happen with one drug could have implications for other drugs. It could actually save time and money and lead to um, cures faster. Um, and then, um, we're, we're now going to talk about another um, constituency that's, that's pretty important to the whole process of medical products, and that's the companies that make them and the people who invest in those companies. And so it is uh, my pleasure for, for this part of the, the conversation to invite uh, Jonathan Leff to join me up here, and um, I will come over and introduce him, and we'll get started. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, great. Um, Jonathan uh, Leff is a partner with Deerfield Management and chairman of the Deerfield Institute. He joined uh, this company in 2013. The company focuses on venture capital and structured investments in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. Prior to joining Deerfield, for more than 16 years, Jonathan was with Warburg Pincus, where he led the firm's investment in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. He's been active in policy discussions related to healthcare and medical innovation, served on the executive committee of the board of the National, the National Venture Capital Association, and led that group's life sciences efforts. He's also served on the Emerging Companies Section Board of the Biotechnology Industry Organization. He's served on many related nonprofit boards, including the Reagan Udall Foundation for the US Food and Drug Administration. Um, he is a graduate of Harvard University and the Stanford School of Business, and we really appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for that very kind introduction, <laughs> and it's great to be here. Good. Well, um, I, uh, I really appreciate it. I think um, I want to jump in. We're going to talk, and we'll have a chance for some questions again through the index cards. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a provocative question. Does the investment community view the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as a necessary evil or as a critical ally? Or something else. Well, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I obviously can't speak on behalf of the entire <laughs> investment community, uh, nor certainly the the uh, biopharma companies and their executives. But I would say that overwhelmingly, FDA is viewed as a critical ally, and it is it is clearly recognized that the ability to do what we all do to invest the huge quantities, the hundreds of millions of dollars necessary to develop drugs and to, to bring those drugs to, to market in a 
way that is, is sustainable is uh, a function of having the FDA and the gold standard of the FDA uh, as the, the uh, regulator. So, and I, and I think that really does distinguish the biopharma enterprise from most other industries where the regulators are viewed as a necessary evil and perhaps a bureaucracy that slows things down. Mm -hmm. Certainly from the industry you will hear uh, complaints about uh, specific decisions or specific interactions that, that are had with FDA and that is to be expected and inevitable because there are so many different perspectives and complexities here. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, almost universally recognized that without a robust and effective FDA, uh, we couldn't make the biopharma innovation enterprise work. What is it about FDA that um, investors uh, want to hear, want to see? What, what, what kinds of um, information can come out of the agency? What kinds of explanations um, are, are people interested in? Sure, well, you know, uh, stepping back, you know, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to be here, Josh, and, and to get the investor perspective on things. And I also want to thank you and your co-authors for the blueprint that, that you put out and the focus that you're bringing to this extremely important issue. Um, because it's one that I actually feel very passionately about. And I've been asked uh, at various times over the last 20 plus years that I've been in the investment business and the venture capital business in biotech, what are the public policy initiatives that, that uh, could be implemented that would make that whole system of innovation work better? And one of the things that I have often said is greater transparency and access, public access to the kinds of information that exist at FDA. Um, I often get a, a stony silence from uh, <laughs> biotech and pharma company CEOs when I say that because I think they take a very, uh, uh, a somewhat more cautious and skeptical perspective of this and we can talk about why. But from my point of view, this is a great opportunity not only to do the kinds of things that have been highlighted already here today, which is to enhance the the uh, decision making that, that medical professionals can make in terms of how to use marketed drugs, but also to, to make uh, the, the whole enterprise of developing drugs better and, and more innovative and more efficient. Now, why is that? I mean, the, the reason I say that is that uh, uh, very simply, the whole purpose of the uh, capital markets, the investment markets, is to direct investment capital to the most promising opportunities. And uh, you know, we all know, we've all seen the statistics about the hundreds of millions of dollars that it costs to develop a drug and the very high failure rates that we have in this sector. Every time that, that huge dollars are invested in a drug that does not ultimately succeed and get to patients, those are dollars that cannot be invested somewhere else. Those are dollars that were in effect wasted. Now you're always going to have that happen because there's so much can't uncertainty. Can't be right all the time. You can't be right all the time. But to the extent that we can be right more often than we currently are, and to the extent that the dollars can be allocated more thoughtfully and based on better information, we'll get more innovation, better drugs, and better returns on investment, which will then translate into more capital, more dollars going into things, and those dollars going to uh, projects that ultimately serve the public health better. And would it be fair to say that transparency has both a direct and indirect effect? Directly because you could pick up a document that the FDA releases, say a complete response letter, and learn something that could influence your investing decision based on the likelihood that a product will succeed or fail. And indirectly, because if the FDA is releasing large quantities of information, people like Professor Dickerson and others will be using that information and producing academic materials that will provide um, insight into the decisions you're making. Absolutely right. I mean, there's the, the immediate company-specific information that one wants to have as an investor to make the best possible decision. One wants to know as much as possible about what can be known about the drug and the experience that is, has been had in, in patients and clinical trials to date. And incredibly importantly, one wants to know what FDA and the company have said to each other about it. One mm -hmm. wants to know uh, if they've really reached agreement on a path to approval and whether the company is studying endpoints in its clinical trials that the FDA will deem to be sufficiently informative to support approval or whether FDA has serious questions and uncertainties about that. One wants to know that. So that's the immediate company-specific or drug-specific information that one wants. 
but then also, as you say, uh, to the extent that the whole enterprise becomes more educated mm -hmm. about what's going on and one can infer learnings from one set of clinical trials to uh, other drugs in the same class or for the same condition that are being developed, that's extraordinarily important. And, and not even just uh, clinical trial information, but regulatory insights. Yeah. When one company has a, or develops and often together with FDA, a better idea about how to develop a drug for a particular condition, what patient population to study, what endpoints to study that will provide the most robust and sensitive treatment effect that's measurable and detectable. Uh, one wants to know that not only for that drug that's being developed, but mm -hmm. for the whole community that's active in that area. So these are incredibly right. important issues. And, and I, I would just say that um, I endorse essentially everything that was in, in your blueprint for greater transparency of the FDA while recognizing that there are countervailing arguments, there are complexities related to yeah. commercially confidential information and burden that is put on FDA, and certainly when you get into patient level data confidentiality, and they're very legitimate concerns that must be addressed and managed on the other side. But I endorse essentially everything that's there. I would say I would just go much further. Okay. It's easy for me to say that, mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, I would certainly endorse the release of uh, complete response letters, or at mm -hmm. least um, as was talked about with, with yeah. uh, the commissioner this morning, the release of clinical and regulatory information, mm -hmm. not, not so much the manufacturing information that may be confidential, but uh, understanding why FDA, what FDA found to be deficient about a company's file for approval and what they're asking for in terms of additional information to, to try to address that is incredibly important, but that even for me is the, the, the end of the road. Most of the time we're investing in companies or in drug development programs that uh, are, are not yet unfortunate enough to have received a complete response letter. Yeah. But we're still very, very interested in what FDA has to say about it and what the company has presented to FDA in the context of the, the back and forth. Right. So, now someone might say, why don't you just have, ask the company? If you're putting them, you know, financing in, why, why wouldn't the company just hand over all the documents? Why, right. I mean, help, help me understand well, the, a, the, the need for FDA to have a policy rather than for you just to work through well, the company. Well, that's a great question um, and, and is often what FDA officials will say. Is, <laughs> don't put this burden on us. You know, companies can release anything mm -hmm. that they want. They can release the, the full correspondence if they choose to. Um, companies essentially never do. I mean, I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen primary FDA uh, uh, documents released in their entirety by companies. Now, why is that? Um, and this is a great perversity in the capital markets as I see it. I spend most of my time investing in private companies and venture capital oriented types of companies, but uh, uh, my colleagues, others at my firm spend a great deal of time investing in public companies. When we invest in private companies, we enter into confidentiality agreements and as investors uh, always demand to see the primary FDA documents. That is a condition to invest and we will essentially never invest if a company won't hand that over to us under, uh, under a confidentiality agreement. Sometimes companies resist a bit, but ultimately if they want our capital, they're going to provide mm -hmm. that. And that, those documents, the back and forth between a company and the FDA throughout the drug development process are very often the most informative things or among the most informative things that we get to see in making investment decisions about companies. And, uh, and often we learn things that we wouldn't have learned anywhere else. Unfortunately, often we find out or sometimes we find out that the way the management has, has conveyed their interactions with FDA are not quite reflecting the full texture of what's in those documents. So they're incredibly informative. When we invest in public companies, we essentially never get to see that. We can't demand that, or we can demand it, the companies can just say no, and, and, and they don't release this information. And, the, and so the perversity of the, if it's the most important information to us as an investor in a private company, a similarly situated public company, billions of dollars of investment decisions are being made all the time in the absence of anyone outside of those right. companies and the FDA seeing that information. That's a, an enormous perversity. And another great perversity that always strikes me is that there are, of course, 
uh, lots of requirements for public companies to release material information about their business, and the SEC is, of course, the, the traffic cop for all of that. Companies are required to, uh, to release any material agreements that they enter into in the course of their business if they're public companies, and those agreements are filed as attachments to, to SEC filings. So I can and any member of the public can go and read the lease that a public company, a, a biotech company, has entered into with its landlord. Mm -hmm. But I can't go and read the, uh, the, the SPA that the company has entered into with the FDA. Or which, they, which sets up what yeah. the key criteria exactly. for the success of their studies are. And, and if you ask me you know, how many times I really care what's in the lease that a yes. biotech company has entered into versus how many times I care about what's in that FDA right. correspondence, the, the difference, you know, there's no comparison. So there's a, a great perversity in what is what is out there in, in public information right. in biotech. So it sounds like it's your view, more data, better decisions that you could make, more likely that, that medical products we develop that are successful, that will get the support, that patients who want drugs to be developed you know, will be able to actually have products developed for their conditions with greater transparency. But I want to go back to the stony faces that you mentioned before. So you, despite this advantage, despite the people who are investing in companies, you know, really wanting to see this information, companies are skeptical. And, you know, I, I wonder whether this is a case where in their own case they're worried about something, but, you know, for the, the whole enterprise it would advance if there were greater transparency. But I'm wondering, you know, how, how, how do you understand their stony faces, as you put it? Well, I, I, there's, a, there's a secret unspoken reason for it. Um, from my point of view, and I'll, I'll tell you what it is here. Company executives are afraid their stock price will go down if all that information is in the public domain. Now, that, and I, I don't mean to minimize the legitimate concerns that are there as well, the, and, and the uh, competitively sensitive information mm -hmm. is very much at the top of the list, and that is a very legitimate concern. But I believe that you know, uh, uh, thoughtful people working through that can manage that in the same way that you can redact competitively sensitive information from your SEC filings. But it doesn't change the fact that it, it is deemed important by the SEC, as it should be for the capital markets to have access to the robust flow of information while redacting what really is competitively sensitive. But the, the, it is a bit of a, a prisoner's dilemma, as you characterize it, because companies are afraid that if they are the only one to release their, their documents, and this goes back to your question as to you know, why don't companies do it. If one company does it and nobody else does, in general, what companies say about their FDA interactions is putting the most positive face on what's in those documents. If you release the documents, then you see all the, the sordid details and mm -hmm. questions that come up in the process and uncertainties and so on. Now, I firmly believe that if that were out there for every company right. in a level playing field, if it were automatically released, then most companies' stock prices, I think, would actually be higher because the greater transparency will lead to greater confidence in investment mm -hmm. decisions. What happens in reality is every time we as investors hear a company describe their interactions with FDA, we have to put a discount factor on it. Because mm -hmm. most companies are forthright, most companies describe it accurately, although even then there may be details that you wish you had that, that aren't described at all, but most companies do describe it fairly. Some don't. And because you don't know in any given case, mm -hmm. you have to ascribe some kind of a discount factor to the things that I may not know about the company's interactions with FDA that I may find out later that will burn me. And so, at the, so how does that play? What is the, how does the discount factor have an impact? It means less money for them. It means less. I mean, what, what's the impact of that when you say? Yeah, that? I mean, it it means uh, instead of being a hundred percent confident that I feel like I know that when the company tells me, for example. We've agreed with FDA that the endpoint that we're using in our phase three program is supportive of approval. So that if we hit that endpoint, FDA will, mm -hmm. will agree that we've demonstrated advocacy in a manner that's sufficient to support approval. Companies say that all the time. Investors ask that question all the time. When you hear that, you say, well, okay, I'm 90% I'm sure that that's true, having the company having said that. And therefore, whatever the valuation is on the business, uh, if I think the company is worth you know, $300 million, it maybe it would be worth $350 million if I were really sure that what they were telling me was true. 
And then, you know, some... That has all kinds of implications all, for your... And that your... has implications for the company's ability to raise capital uh, when they go out to, to issue stock to raise capital to, right. to advance their clinical trial development programs. Uh, the, the companies care immensely as they need to what is the valuation of their company, what is their stock price, because that informs right. their ability to raise capital. So if we have a situation where individual companies, which are very worried about specific products, you know, don't want to be the first one to put all their information out there and you know, potentially have it picked apart where all their competitors aren't doing that, and yet at the same time, if all the information were out there, the whole enterprise would go forward, and like you said, maybe their stock prices would even be higher, and, and more importantly, um, investors from, from the company's perspective would be more interested in investing more. Um, how do we get over that hump? And now, in the context of what Dr. Gottlieb announced today, you know, he's, he's taking some steps that FDA hasn't taken before, but he's taking sort of modest steps. You know, he's, he's starting with the CSRs. He's assigned someone to look at 100 complete response letters. Um, he seems to have a few um, ideas on how to get the companies to move forward, you know, he, he seems to be saying that part of the deal will be a different, maybe more coherent review that they'll get if they sign up for this. But um, what are the kinds of things that you think can, uh, people can do, and maybe, you know, not just the investment community, but others, if they want to support uh, what the commissioner is doing and really see him go further? Well, you know, I think it's a matter of public policy. I don't think that this this prisoner's dilemma can be solved by exhorting companies to release information. They are not going to unless everybody else does and everybody else isn't going to unless they have to for some reason. So it seems to me there, and I'm not the, the mm -hmm. uh, you know, expert on the legalities here, but, but ultimately uh, it falls to some kind of, of legislation or, or policy decision by uh, regulators to say, we are going to make available this information, or we're going to require that companies make available certain categories of information. So, I mean, my, in my sim simple way of thinking about it, the simple way to do this would be uh, for FDA to release everything in the way that the SEC releases essentially everything. I mean, I can go in and see not only a company's SEC filings, but I can see the drafts of the SEC filings that were submitted to the SEC that the SEC commented on and, and the back and forth that led to the final filing, um, would certainly like to be able to, a similar kind of, of concept at FDA where all these documents that already exist, companies make their submissions to FDA in the context of formal meetings, FDA responds to those with formal responses, all of those meetings result in in formal minutes that are uh, uh, ultimately mm -hmm. released or ultimately provided to the company. It, 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 this is not probably not practical in a single step, but I sort of. Uh, uh, You'll take where, it all. Where I'd like to see <laughs> if we could envision where we would love mm -hmm. to be and love to get to somehow. If you could release all of that with mechanisms to redact and to enable companies to. to uh, redact information that really is competitively sensitive, mm -hmm. that would solve this problem. And uh, you know, you're not imposing a whole lot more burden on FDA because they're already producing these documents. Mm -hmm. We're just saying we're going to post them on a, a, mm -hmm. uh, a server somewhere that the public can access. Um, now, this redaction process would require some meaningful resources. I don't mean to trivialize that. But it's a whole lot easier than what is often talked about and that I think FDA struggles with for good reason, which is the idea that FDA should police companies' public statements. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, in the absence of doing anything like I'm talking about here, yeah. it probably is a good thing for FDA, FDA to be able to counter truly misleading right. information that is put out into the marketplace. So I would endorse that. But that's a huge burden on FDA to try and figure out, track that information, figure out when they really should take that step versus when they shouldn't, and the potential for it to become political is, is enormous. Um, it would be a whole lot easier if FDA didn't have to police it because the real information was in the public domain. So if companies decide to, yeah. to spin that information, everybody can see it. Okay. Well, I'm certainly very uh, here loud and clear your, your confidence in FDA to have a good sense of the products and your interest in transparency for the sake of your investments. I, I'm curious where you are on the spectrum. Like, let's 
let's assume um, I can understand you're not maybe getting standing ovations with this in a room full of biotech CEOs who are worried about their particular products. What about in the investor community? Are you all the way over on the edge of the spectrum? Are you, do you think that there are other people out in, in, in the investment community who share your perspective on transparency? Well, we'll, we'll perhaps we'll get to test that because people will see what I've said here and we'll see what kind, of, <laughs> what kind of reaction we get to that. I mean, honestly, it's not something that is talked about enough. Mm -hmm. And I served on the board of the National Venture Capital Association, led their life sciences effort for many years. This was never high on the agenda. Um, and it should be higher on the agenda. Um, and maybe it will be now that, that people like yourself and others mm -hmm. here are taking the step to give this issue a greater public profile and greater prominence. I think that when investors really think this through, it, it becomes hard for me to see uh, how investors would find greater transparency of FDA-related information to be anything other than good for the the innovation enterprise. It is a more complicated question, as we've talked about, for biotech and pharma company executives who are worried mm -hmm. a lot about uh, losing control of the flow of information and also legitimately worried about enabling right. their competitors. So it has to be done well, but and maybe a little bit more across the board. Do you think that the investment community has any leverage that could be brought? Maybe as one investor, you can't you know, get a public company to change its behavior. But if a whole bunch of investors said, like, you know, we need to know the complete response letters, those should be released, or, you know, or some statement, is there, is that a potential source of leverage, even if it is leverage, it could be leveraged directly on the companies, it could be leveraged for the policy process, for people to realize that there's a broader constituency, it's not a democratic or a Republican issue at all, you know, that it would advance the science. I mean, I do think that investors, the investment community, when it gets organized and through trade groups that can be very effective, like National Venture Capital Association, can can bring to bear some some positive uh, attention uh, to these kinds of issues in the political sphere, because it's not viewed as uh, you know when, when pharma or biotech trade organizations say something, it's always a question through the lens of is this just trying to increase the profits of those companies. But when investors try and speak about the you know, greater efficiency in the entire uh, investment process and in, in innovation enterprise, I think that uh, very often policymakers respond favorably to that. Now, overcoming, if, if this is something that the biotech and pharma industries fundamentally resist, that's a very difficult thing to overcome. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not the, the political expert, but that can be a very challenging environment, um, I think investors can play a real role in helping to, to voice the issue. Well, I think that there's a convergence because you have not only interest at the top of the FDA, but you have what the other regulatory agencies are doing around the world and um, interest in the investor community, certainly a very strong public health rationale. And, you know, hopefully they, this can, you know, come together and everyone can play a role in really getting the um, process to a new stage of transparency that can have benefits from multiple constituencies, including companies. I think that's, that's the goal. Um, I think uh, we, checking whether there are any other questions. Let me just say how appreciative I am that you're here. This has been so interesting. And I wish I had met you when I was at FDA. <laughs> <laughs> Could have teamed up on things. But um, I think that it is really important for people to hear the different perspectives. and. It's very important to understand, I think, and I think if there's one real message from today, it's that um, transparency has benefits um, for all of our ability to get better medical products and that it really is a, a team effort and, and, and there's a lot um, of uh, opportunity for the FDA to move forward. So fantastic. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. See, so I think we're going to keep going. If I see Dr. Kesselheim, there he is. Um, we're going to move on to our last panel, uh, which is about correcting misinformation. I'm going to ask Dr.
Kesselheim to um, introduce the panel, but let me just say a little bit about Dr. Kesselheim. He is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a faculty member in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He created and leads the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law. Um, he, I'll just, he, he has testified before Congress, written hundreds of papers. I'll just say I know Aaron is on vacation when I only get three of his papers to review in a month. Actually, there's, there's a, a group of people um, in the academic world who believe that Aaron is not just one person, but there are multiple people who together are Aaron Kesselheim because he's such a prolific author on so many different topics related to um, uh, medications and devices. Um, both uh, from a policy perspective, a research perspective, and a legal perspective. He is the editor of the uh, Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, which is uh, this journal that published the supplement on transparency. And he is um, uh, also uh, very, very committed to having the FDA work more effectively for the people, um, including all of us who count on it. So Aaron, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Josh, for that uh, very nice introduction. On behalf of the collective Aaron Kesselheim, I am Aaron Kesselheim, uh, here to uh, introduce the final panel of the day um, that relates to uh, a very another important set of public health functions that greater transparency about information and regulatory decisions about the FDA can play. Um, I want to thank Alan Cockle. Um, and Pew for hosting this, organi this, this meeting um, for the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics for um, uh, organizing the publishing of the, uh, of the special supplement, and, and of course to uh, Commissioner Gottlieb and, um, for, his, uh, for his remarks at the beginning of the day. Um, so in, in certain, the, the, the focus of this, um, this final panel of the day is, is the fact that in, in certain high-profile cases, manufacturers have released incorrect or, or incomplete information into the market um, that was directly counter to the information, um, the contemporaneous information that the FDA had. And in the, uh, in the 2010 FDA um, Transparency Task Force that, that Dr. Sharfstein led, they noted that selective publication of clinical trial results has in the past created a misleading picture of the safety and efficacy of a product with negative implications for public health. Um, and as the practice uh, now still stands, Manufacturers have wide latitude to publicly characterize data that are submitted to the FDA um, without much risk that the FDA will correct the record. And so I think that uh, what we're going to try to um, talk a little bit about in the, in the next hour um, is, uh, you know, in, in these cases, uh, does uh, the FDA have a public health or an ethical responsibility to correct the record? Um, and if so, how? So in the blueprint, um, we outlined a couple principles. Um, that might help organize this kind of um, approach. So, um, you know, first, should the agency adapt um, a basic set of standards um, for when to correct misinformation? Um, should the agency give uh, advance notice to manufacturers regarding any concerns that they have? And if so, how would that happen? Um, and should the FDA disclose the scientific information that's the basis for its concern about misinformation? And hopefully we'll be able to get into some of those topics with uh, uh, a distinguished group of, of panelists that we have um, to talk about this today. So I'm going to introduce our panelists who are going to um, proceed in, in giving their remarks um, and in giving some of their experience from um, public health, advocacy, um, and academic uh, points of view. Um, and meanwhile, if you all have, um, have those cards still, please do start writing down your questions on those cards so that we can uh, address them in an efficient way. Um, after they're finished with their comments. So um, our panelists today first are, is, uh, is Peter Lurie, who is the president of the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Uh, previously, Dr. Lurie was the associate commissioner for public health strategy analysis and analysis um, at the FDA. And in your packets, there are, are much longer um, bios um, for these uh, very distinguished uh, people. Um, second uh, is Dr. Eric Turner, um, who is an associate professor of psychiatry at Oregon Health and Science University. His research is aimed at increasing medical transparency to make the evidence base more complete, um, truthful, and reliable. Um, and then third, we have uh, Dr. Michael Karom, 
who is the director of Public Citizens Health Research Group. Public Citizen is one of the leading public health advocacy groups um, in the country um, and is uh, editor of Public Citizens Worst Pills, Best Pills uh, News, a monthly newsletter that provides reviews of the safety of prescription over-the-counter drugs. Um, unfortunately, our fourth panelist, um, Sharon Bra Shannon Brownlee, is, um, was not able to be here because of extended uh, jury duty that she had. So um, she is serving the public in a different regard today, um, but is unfortunately not able, uh, not able to be with us. But um, I would like to start with, uh, with Dr. Lurie, and, and we'll, go, we'll go through the three panelists, and then um, please uh, save all your questions, and we'll collect them at the end and, have a, and hopefully have a good discussion at that point. Thank you very much. Okay, um, good morning everybody, and um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, Aaron said that um, one of the, uh, what, what this panel in part is about is about the difference between information uh, that the FDA might hold contemporaneous with uh, information in the public realm. Um, my um, background had been in an activist group at Public Citizen, um, and you can imagine me um, really um, rubbing my hands together with glee when I was employed at the FDA and finally got a chance to see some of this contemporaneous information. Um, and the information that I'm going to present today is uh, really about finding a way to make some of that contemporaneous information public um, by aggregating data in such a way that you wouldn't be able to identify any particular company or product, but would nonetheless be able to convey certain information about uh, this you know, contemporaneous information, as it were. Um, so that's the, the basic outline. Um, as mentioned, I'm now with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. This research that I will present uh, was done while at the FDA. I'm speaking um, not as an FDA employee, since I'm not one. Um, but some of my colleagues from FDA who helped work with me on these papers are, are present today, Dan Sigelman and Harinda Chahal. So um, let's see. So um, really, the presentation consists of two parts, uh, a presentation about two uh, separate papers. Um, one of them you've actually kind of heard a little bit about over the course of the day, uh, a publication on complete response letters, um, <clears throat> which for the benefit of people in the um, watching uh, viewers from afar, um, our complete response letters are letters that uh, disclose the reasons why the FDA might have decided not to approve a drug. Um, the second paper relates to uh, the publication of post-marketing requirements, or I'll use the term PMRs, which are uh, requirements that the FDA can now impose upon a manufacturer whose drug has been approved uh, in order that they conduct follow-up studies uh, to better inform the safety or effectiveness or other profile of the drug. Um, so those are the two studies, and they have quite a bit in common, as it turns out, um, and uh, I'll, I'll turn to them one, uh, in turn. So uh, here's the first one. Uh, it relates to the complete response letters, or CRLs, and what we did in our study was to look at uh, all the CRLs for new drug applications that had been put out by the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, only that part of FDA, um, for the period of August 2008 to 2013. And uh, what we did was something which I presume is something similar to what uh, Dr. Gottlieb is now having someone at FDA do, which is we took 61 of these CRLs and we chopped them up. Um, and we chopped them up into seven different domains, uh, like safety, effectiveness, pharmacokinetics, so forth. Um, and then each and every sentence or group of sentences uh, within the CRL was assigned to one of these domains. And then we go on to describe the frequency of those. Uh, we actually get further into what we call subdomains, um, but I've left that out of this talk. Um, that's available in the BMJ paper, um, for which the reference is at the bottom. Um, and then we looked at the percentage of the CRLs that had a matching press release. So part question one really was, what's in the CRL? Because nobody really knew. Um, and the, the second part was, well, given that, the, the, that we at FDA could see the CRL, what was it that the public was able to see? What could they see in a press release? Um, what, uh, what percentage of the, of the statements appear in the, in the press release? So did they release a press release? And if so, how much information was actually disclosed? 
And then we also looked at uh, Securities and Exchange Commission SEC filings to see if there was any supplementary information over there. So um, again, the, the first question was, well, why does the FDA turn down a drug? And that is a very fundamental question to which there was no public answer. Uh, and in, in the absence of information, uh, there were at least some people who believed the drugs were sometimes not approved for lack of a cross T or lot of, lack of a dotted I. Uh, and you know, our experience was that was not the case. Uh, we thought the, you know, that they were usually for substantive reasons, and we wanted to set about uh, finding out whether that was true. So there were 61 CRLs, as I mentioned, um, and this is the number of these CRLs that made mention of a reason for disapproval in these seven domains to which I referred. And you can see, first of all, that there were an array of different reasons that the, the products were turned down. You can tell also by the numbers over here that many had much more than one reason, right? Since the, there were 61 and many of them have, you know, in the 40s. And you can also see that efficacy, safety, and this is clinical manufacturing and controls, uh, were the primary reasons. But most importantly, um, about two-thirds of the, 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 uh, of the uh, CRLs had an efficacy reason for turning down the product and a similar number of safety. As I say at the bottom, 87% had either a safety or an efficacy re reason included in the CRL, um, and 48% uh, had both. So we drew the conclusion from this that, in fact, the FDA does not turn down uh, products for trivial reasons. Uh, and uh, hopefully that has helped to counter the misinformation of, on that point in a general way. Of course, that doesn't answer the question of what might be happening for any particular CRL because that is not yet being released. Okay, um, so in, in here, um, we're looking again at CRLs as the unit of analysis. And the question is, what did the companies do when they received their CRL? And the answer was that in about 18% of cases, um, 11 of the 61 CRLs, there was no press release whatsoever and really no way for anybody to know that the product had been rejected. Um, in an additional 13, uh, the company put out a press release that said that a complete response letter had been released, but provided no details whatsoever of what that reason was. And then the rest of this are the fraction of the statements um, that were matched. So I, we have 61 CRLs. They're maybe about 10 pages long a piece. And I mentioned we broke them down into statements. The 61 CRLs had an average of 10 to 11 statements per CRL. So there's a 10 pages long with about 10 separate statements or groups of statements. The question is what fraction of the statements were actually there? And you can see that in those that had a press release that actually gave reasons, you can see that typically only 1 to 25 percent of the statements were matched and only occasionally were higher fractions of the statements actually disclosed. Okay. So now we're looking, we're changing the frame to instead looking, of looking at the CRLs, now the unit of analysis is the statements themselves, of which I mentioned there were 687. And now we're looking at those seven, same several seven domains that I mentioned earlier. And in the red are statements that never appeared in a, a press release. And in the yellow are the, praise, that the, are the statements that did. And you, so you can see what the matching, what the matching rates are. Um, the highest matching rates are for safety and effectiveness. The overall matching rate is 14%. Higher in safety and effectiveness, like I say, uh, and much lower in these other things. So the, the companies are leaving out, well, 86% of the information. Um, they're more likely to disclose safety and effectiveness information, but even their critical, crit critical information is often not included. For example, there were seven CRLs that mentioned a statistically significant, or at least, a signif at least an increase in mortality rates between treated and comparison groups, and only one of those seven trials had a matching press release that disclosed that fact. Um, there was, if there was a requirement for a uh, an additional clinical trial, which is very much, uh, you know, the 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 the, the 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 key sort of turning point for the company um, as to whether or not they will 
um, be able to rapidly get a product approved or not, even that was only disclosed about 59% of the time. Okay. Finally, we looked at the Securities Exchange Commission filings uh, to see if there was any additional information over there. And we did find a small amount of additional information, which brought the overall amount of public information, you know, just a little bit, you know, 14 to 15%. But most of the information is not made available. Again, this is at the statement level uh, in either source. Okay, whoops, sorry. So the second study, which I'll hurry through, is uh, about these post-marketing requirements, the PMRs. Uh, we looked at all of those that were fulfilled, right? So this does not get at the question of whether or not the studies are actually done. This is among those that are done. Um, and we asked whether or not by at least three years later, 2016, the PMR had been published either in the scientific literature, in clinicaltrials.gov, um, or in either source. And these are the results. Uh, the take-home number is probably this one right here. Um, the, the PMRs were published in either the scientific literature or clinicaltrials.gov in 64% of cases. Uh, you can see that the, there are higher publication rates in the, in the scientific literature than in clinicaltrials.gov. But really, that sort of obscures the fact that there's um, really an interaction based on what kind of trial it was. So you can see these are the interventional clinical trials as opposed to other trials that, uh, that were fulfilled. And there are, in the first place, more interventional clinical trials than other kinds of trials. And you can, you can also see that a greater fraction of the interventional clinical trials are published um, than is the case for the other trials. Um, so the first bullet point here is just saying that that difference that I just mentioned was statistically significant. Um, many of you will ask the question of whether or not there was a difference in publication rate between those with a favorable or an unfavorable outcome from the sponsor's perspective. And we did not find a statistically significant difference when it came to that. Um, in the interest of time, I'll uh, just pass over the, uh, what the predictors are. They're not especially striking and, 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 and strong as it happens. Um, so, so just in conclusion, um, again, two different kinds of studies that uh, turn out to have a lot in common. Uh, the first is that the publication of both the CR letters and the PMR results were recommended in the transparency report back as far as 2010. Um, and that um, our data show that in both cases, the reporting uh, has been less than optimal. Um, broadly, they share the same potential solutions, despite being very different kinds of documents. Um, on the one hand, the companies could, at least in theory, publish uh, voluntarily, but they obviously are not doing so in a consistent way. Um, or on the other hand, the FDA could publish the relevant document, um, although in each case, there would be a requirement for some uh, regulatory changes. Um, the advantages of publication would be, and we've heard much of this this morning, a more informed discussion by everyone of the scientific reasons for the agency's actions, um, which could in turn potentially facilitate drug discovery. Uh, there could be, in general, the, uh, uh, more transparency on the agency's regulatory processes and their decision making. Uh, and misperceptions about the reasons why drugs are not approved um, or what the results of these PMR studies, uh, any misperceptions could be clarified. And the disadvantages are, uh, as we've heard from, uh, uh, from the last discussion, uh, there's industry concern that competitors might be advantaged. Uh, there's the potential for release of confidential commercial or uh, trade secret information, although uh, I think most of us in this room would agree that the FDA is at least as good as it ought to be um, in protecting that information. Um, and finally, there's the ever-present issue of agency workload. And there, I think, um, there is a legitimate issue, um, having once been a person with a workload at FDA. Um, in, in that, you know, I, I think that what we're especially interested in, and I think Dr. Gottlieb got at this, is that um, information that relates to safety and effectiveness, um, much less than information about manufacturing. So I think that information that is most related to drug discovery, most related, related to clinical outcomes, uh, might be a way to cabin the information such that almost everything important to the public would be released, uh, but that the workload on the agency could be kept to a reasonable level. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Actually, maybe I can turn off the microphone since I have, no, leave it on? Okay. Okay, so I do not have PowerPoint to hide behind. I'm so used to speaking with PowerPoint, I'm a little intimidated here. So um, it's been a long time. So I'm going to use old-fashioned note cards here. I'm just wave like back in high school. Um, I'm going to speak, so my name is Eric Turner. I'm sorry I didn't uh, introduce myself. I am a, um, I'm a psychiatrist by training and a former FDA reviewer. And I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, from a perspective as uh, a clinician and also as a former FDA reviewer, so as a, um, a consumer of the information as well as a uh, a participant in the production of the uh, information. So, um, first of all, um, oh, and, and one theme I want to touch on is not uh, just the, um, uh, the the qualitative, the types of things that are disclosed, but also the manner in which it's disclosed and get at the idea of transparency versus uh, translucency. Because you can think of transparency as being on it. We talk about more transparency, and transparency indeed is a continuum. It's not an either-or thing. So one thing um, I like to talk about is the you know drug approval packages, which is where uh, I have uh, done most of my research work with. I uh, was told back when I was an FDA reviewer that I would be that when my the fruits of my labor were complete and the drug were approved then uh, the, um, my review would be up on the internet for the world to see, and that was kind of uh, sobering. I, I knew that I was charged with an important job, and that if I messed up, uh, it, would, it, it would be there for the, uh, for the, world, uh, the world to see. So uh, one, uh, one of my first reviews that I worked on was, um, and I think I can say it now because as I learned earlier today, uh, something that's become public is no longer commercial confidential information. Uh, this is now public. I'd, I was given an, an NDA new drug application to work on on the drug uh, rivoxetine, which had been approved in Europe uh, as an antidepressant uh, the, the year before I got there in 97. I'd, I started working on it in 98. Uh, gosh, that was a long time ago. Um, and uh, I was immediately struck by the uh, quantity of negative studies. I had never seen this before. It was, uh, I had done a fellowship at uh, National Institutes of Health and thought I was at Mecca there and thought I had act, should have access to everything one, one would uh, need to know about drugs, but I found out that I'd really been in the dark and uh, I was, uh, the, the, my eyes were opened up on my FDA experience. Uh, there and seeing again all these negative studies, and I mentioned it to my boss. I said, well, "Is this is this a fluke?" And he says, "No, this happens all the time." And that kind of uh, it was in a way I can see the humor in it, but at the same time, it was um, disturbing that uh, in my other hat, as a, uh, in private practice, I should be a clinician, and and would would have been if not for my FDA position, would have been totally unaware that this was going on and blissfully prescribing these drugs believing that the drugs always be placebo, and here I was learning uh, that this was not at all the case. Um, so later, after leaving the FDA, I did some um, formal, formal studies of this phenomenon, and uh, my first such study, and the one that's perhaps best known, is looking at antidepressants. Uh, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, and took a, a cohort of 12 antidepressants going back to Prozac and coming up through uh, 2004 with duloxetine, um, and looked at all the studies that had been registered with the FDA, and then tracked those into the published literature and asked two questions. First of all, was the study in question published? And number two, if it was published, was it published in a way that was consistent with, with the FDA? And it turned out that there was quite a, a discrepancy between these two views. There's the, what, as a clinician, you might see, you, you would get the impression looking at journal articles that virtually and nearly 100%, uh, it, it was greater than 90% of, of the articles conveyed a positive conclusion, the ones that were published. On the other hand, if you were looking at FDA reviews, uh, you saw that it was really about 50-50. And, and by and positive, I mean reached statistical significance where the drug beat placebo. Um, so quite a, a striking difference between nearly 100% and 50%. And then if you were looking at it from a meta-analytic point of view, if you're a, a person doing systematic reviews and meta-analyses, uh, there was a similar discrepancy, not quite as striking, um, but there was a shift in the uh, effect size by a third. You would, uh, 
uh, the effect size went up, according to the FDA, would have, you calculate a 0.3. Uh, uh, standard deviations using journal data, you calculate 0.4. So that was a one-third increase in uh, meta-analytic effect size. Uh, and then uh, we later did uh, other studies like this using drugs for anxiety and drugs for schizophrenia and got similar, you know, got a similar view of things. Um, and, uh, but it, and then other people have, have done this uh, studies making use of FDA data. And I, and I guess what I'd like to segue to now is that it's been a bit disappointing that, that uh, not more has been done with this approach, that the FDA data is there. It's on the FDA website. But it's um, it's still strikingly underutilized and I, and I think uh, underappreciated, and so I'd, uh, it, it's been there since uh, ninety seven is ninety seven is when the reviews start going up online, yet uh, very few people seem to uh, know about it. And when I say few people, I mean not only obviously lay people, but even researchers. Most uh, I think most uh, people in medical research are unaware of this. There was a. Uh, a study done by uh, Jeppe Schroll of Denmark uh, surveying authors of Cochrane reviews and the Cochrane collaboration, as I'm sure uh, uh, essentially all of you know, is is very highly revered as the uh, people who do the you know the most uh, highly renowned uh, systematic reviews and meta analyses. But they they one of the questions they asked was how many Cochrane reviewers how many uh, are actually using regulatory data, and he found that that 97% are not, have not used regulatory data. This is, this is bad. Um, so, but why is that? I think part of this is a lack of appreciation. Perhaps some people simply didn't know about it. Um, our training is that we are taught that the published literature is the be all and end all of, you know, the most authoritative uh, information on, on uh, uh, medical interventions. Um, so we might be skeptical about that there might be something even better elsewhere. The, um, and also I think just the, the fact that these, there are obstacles, if they do know about it, then they find, you know, some, uh, uh, well, uh, for lack of a better word, a user unfriendliness of, of, the, of the reviews. So uh, to talk about drug approval packages, for instance, uh, uh, they, uh, you first of all, you have to, uh, you, you need a number of mouse clicks to even find your way to drugs at FDA and then to the drug that you're looking for and then sorting out which one has the, has the efficacy and safety reviews to separate that out from the generics which are, which have no efficacy and safety reviews. Um, that's, that's one issue. Secondly, you, um, you will typically, for a drug, uh, you're, uh, if you're looking for the very first indication that was approved for, for the drug in question, well, you're, you're in luck. You, you probably will find that. If, on the other hand, you're looking for indication number two or number three, well, you're not in luck. You usually will not find that. And this has been attributed largely to a workload issue. Oh, well, you know, we don't have the personnel to put the reviews up uh, on, on, online for the second and third indications. But we might do that if we get a number of FOIA requests for that. So navigating to the reviews, finding what you're looking for, and then once you get there, you, um, you might find, you'll find, a, a, for instance, a medical review, which a couple of hundred pages often might be broken up into at least four different PDF files. Um, and then when you, I guess because of the size, the size of the document, and then when you get to it, you will often find, now for newer drugs, you're in luck because they are searchable, but for older drugs, five years or older, and as we've heard previously from a Dr. Dr. Dickerson, you know, most of what we're using out there are, are these older drugs. They, they're not going away. These drugs are proved back, and like I mentioned, Prozac included in our, that's still very much uh, alive and well and being used quite a bit. So um, you'll get there, you get to the review, and you find out that you've got one big long image document. And the reason for that is that it's been, the, the review was printed out. At one point, it was redacted. In the old days, they would redact it with whiteout even. Uh, and then they would scan it in, and it would be scanned in as a big, as an image. So the only way to, to look through it is with your eyeballs. The old-fashioned way, you could print it out, you could sort the pages. If you're high-tech, 
you can run it through, you can use a program and use optical character recognition. But that's limited too. You, you can't go back to the original uh, user friendliness of the original PDF that was created by the reviewer because inside tables you've got numbers and the, the OCR cannot, it usually freaks out when it, when it hits those tables and it just won't, it won't read them. So um, it, it's very limited. So, um, and then the table of contents, it would be nice if there were a table of contents you could navigate around. There is a table of contents in the reviews, but it's not hyperlinked because the whole thing is an image document, as I mentioned. Um, I'd like to mention one other type of FDA document besides drug approval packages, and that's advisory committee documents as well. They, are, they can also be quite valuable for correcting misinformation. Example uh, would be the drug uh, Muraglitazar. Uh, th there was an advisory committee back that in the early 2000s. It led to a, um, a JAMA paper by Steve Nissen and uh, colleagues. And it, uh, I'm not saying there's cause and effect here, but the, uh, the, the FDA decided not to approve. Uh, rumor has it that they were leaning towards approval, but it was not. So the correcting misinformation there had an impact using advisory committee. Uh, documents. Another type of document that I um, have not used at all yet, uh, pediatric uh, documents, uh, pediatric approvals, and, and I found uh, an, a nice example of a drug that was actually, um, that was not approved, which is unusual, like Paxil, uh, paroxetine for pediatric depression, um, which has been the subject of a lot of controversy. Uh, that, the FDA review, is actually online, but I never would have known it until recently, and uh, I won't say um, how I, how I uh, was pointed to it, um, but uh, I was given the exact URL and I was able to find the review. Later, a few days later, I went, let's see, how now where was that? And I went into Google and I tried to find it using certain keywords and I was unable to find it. So it's there somewhere, it's buried in the website, but I don't think, you know, good luck finding it. Um, so. Let me move to my sort of wish list uh, of what, uh, in a, you know, they're the flip side of many of the comments that I've made already. Uh, it'd be nice if we could have access to, to move further along on this transparency, uh, this, from translucency to transparency continuum, getting more of the indications, the subsequent indications up on the website. Um, the, secondly, the ability to navigate through the documents um, I think we could take these older documents. These documents were created in Microsoft Word and um, they were converted to PDF and at that point they were searchable, including the, the, the uh, text and the tables and the, and the numbers. And um, those could then be, now this is sort of backtracking, it might sound like, like a lot of busy work, but again, these older drugs are the ones that are in, in the greatest, probably greater use than newer drugs. They could then be redacted electronically uh, the way the, the newer drugs are. It would be nice to, um, as a more organizational approach, rather than looking in these different places, one place for advisory committee uh, documents, and I didn't, I didn't complain about advisory committee doctor. You basically have to know what committee, what the committee was, and uh, when it was, and then you can find your way to it. So rather than have that, uh, that organization or indexing method, why not just put it along with the drug, um, have it indexed by drug, and you could also have the uh, index by indication. So if you're looking for depression, you could find drugs. You could also maybe find de uh, devices that are uh, approved for depression. And then once you find the drug or the intervention you're looking for, you can look up, you can find the drug approval package, of course, and you can um, also find perhaps the new complete response letters, uh, if that indeed is going to come to pass. You find the pediatric indication, uh, pediatric approval uh, documents, and the advisory committee documents. So um, just some, uh, and I'm just about out of time, so on the topic of advisory committee, I just wanna make a, a plea, just a suggestion uh, that we are talking, this is a symposium on transparency at the FDA. Why not an advisory committee for transparency at the FDA? Rather it be once every 10 years, uh, we could have an ongoing discussion 
uh, with the between the various stakeholders. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Mike Crone from Public Citizen, and I'd like to acknowledge that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, one of our other health researchers, Sammy, Dr. Sammy Almashat, uh, helped uh, co-author the comments I'm going to make. And as the final speaker of the day, you're going to find that I'm going to be reiterating many of the points uh, that you've already heard today. So much of the information upon which the FDA relies when making pivotal regulatory decisions with regard to regulated pro products is kept secret. And one prominent example of the FDA's lack of transparency concerns new drug applications or NDAs, including supplemental NDAs that have been rejected by the agency or withdrawn by the company. The FDA's longstanding policy is that it does not release its analyses of data submitted for such applications or disclose agency complete response letters describing non-approval decisions and the reasons for those actions nor does the agency even notify the public that such rejections or withdrawals have occurred. By contrast, the FDA releases to the public its detailed analyses and findings related to data supporting the approval of a, of a drug's first NDA and upon request by at least three individuals of supplemental NDAs for new uses of already marketed drugs. So I'd like to bracket my general comments with two real life case examples. And the first case involves valdecoxib, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID, known as a selective cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor that was marketed in the US jointly by Pfizer and Pharmacia under the brand name Bextra before it was removed from the market for safety concerns in 2005. In January 2001, J.D. Searle, then a subsidiary of Pharmacia, submitted an NDA, the initial NDA, to the FDA for approval to market this drug for four indications, relief of the signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis and of rheumatoid arthritis, treatment of primary dysmenorrhea or menstrual cycle pain, and prevention and treatment of acute pain, including opioid sparing and prevention of operative pain. In November 2001, the FDA approved the drug for only the first three indications, but not the fourth acute pain. In December 2001, Public Citizen requested from FDA a copy of the approval packets for Bextra. And in early 2002, the FDA posted on its website a complete copy of the requested approval package. But a few days later, before Public Citizen staff saw the information, and at the request of Searle, the FDA removed from its website the package. At a later date, FDA reposted the approval package, but it had redacted all of the information regarding the acute pain indication and, and the safety and efficacy data related to that, claiming that the information involved trade secrets and confidential commercial information. In May 2002, a medical journal article and a related press release were published touting Bextra for treating acute pain, in this case associated with dental surgery. The article was co-sponsored by Pfizer and Pharmacia, and three of its five authors were employees of Pharmacia. Public Citizen subsequently submitted a FOIA request for the unredacted approval package, and in response to a lawsuit filed by our organization in 2004, the FDA released much of the information previously redacted from the approval package which showed that the FDA had denied approval of Bexta for treating acute pain because of safety concerns. In particular, safety data from a trial that tested valdecoxib as an adjunct to narcotic analgesia in patients undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery revealed an excess of serious adverse events, including death, in subjects receiving valdecoxib compared to those receiving placebo. So in terms of some general comments, the 2017 blueprint builds on the work of the FDA's 2010 Transparency Task Force, which recommended that the agency, among other things, release complete response letters to shed light on why drug marketing applications were refused. The blueprint report noted several potential benefits from releasing such information, including that 
The clinical community can benefit from the insight, expertise, and analyses of FDA reviewers, and researchers can learn from the failures of previous medical products and subsequent research programs. Keeping the public in the dark about unapproved drug marketing applications prevents patients, researchers, and healthcare providers from gaining insight into a why, why a drug's application was not approved. This lack of transparency is particularly troubling in cases where the FDA has found a currently marketed drug to be ineffective or unsafe for a newly proposed indication. Disclosure of the FDA's findings in such cases would promote public health by encouraging healthcare providers to avoid prescribing drugs for unapproved or off-label uses that the agency has deemed to be potentially dangerous or ineffective. This is especially important given the endemic practice where pharmaceutical industry is engaged in illegal marketing drugs for off-label uses. Disclosure of complete response letters is all the more important given the current permissive framework allowing, in some ways, the promotion of marketed drugs for unapproved uses. Existing, existing FDA guidance already permits drug and medical device manufacturers to market their products to physicians for unapproved uses through dissemination of scientific or medical journal articles and reference publications. And Congress is considering legislation that would further expand the scope of such off-label promotion. Such erosion of restrictions on off-label marketing make it vital that healthcare professionals be informed of off-label uses that were deemed by the FDA to be too dangerous or ineffective for, for patients. Failing to provide information on unapproved NDAs also gives companies free reign to craft their own self-serving narratives as to why their product applications were turned down, as Dr. Lurie discussed in detail. Finally, a new policy of transparency whereby the FDA discloses the existence of and data related to rejected applications for new drugs and new indications for already approved drugs also would be consistent with the Belmont Report's basic ethical principle of beneficence, which governs human subject research. This principle establishes an ethical obligation to minimize possible harms and maximize potential benefits to human subjects participating in research. In the event that a drug marketing application is rejected by the FDA, because the FDA determines that the drug's harms outweigh its benefits for a particular use, both the drug company and the agency have an ethical obligation to make this determination public in order to avoid future clinical trials of the drug, or in some cases, a similar drug in, an, in the same class that would unnecessarily expose human subjects to harm. Now, a policy whereby the agency, the FDA, releases complete response letters and the underlying analyses leading to the agency's decision not to approve an application is certainly feasible. In 2004, the European Union required the EMA, that the EMA make publicly accessible information about all refusals of human drug marketing applications and the reasons for them. The EU law stipulated that after an EMA decision rejecting a sponsor's drug application or where the sponsor has withdrawn the application before the EMA has completed its assessment, the agency must publish, among other things, a public assessment report containing the EMA's analyses and conclusions related to the clinical trial data in the application. One can now research the EMA's website for all public assessment reports with specific searches available for drugs that have been refused marketing authorization or have been suspended or withdrawn from the market. Now, Health Canada followed suit in 2015 when it announced that it would make available to the public all regulatory decision summaries, which contain the rationale for Health Canada's decisions on drug marketing applications. This decision notably includes for public release final negative decisions and cancellations for all marketing applications of new drugs and new indications for existing drugs. And this data can be searched for on the Health Canada website. So let me conclude with a, a second case example. In September 2008, Johnson & Johnson submitted an application to the EMA for an additional indication for its antipsychotic drug palpiridone or Invega, the treatment of acute manic episodes associated with bipolar one disorder. The company withdrew its application 85 days into the EMA's review of the application, quote, based on feedback from the early EMA evaluation indicating that the data provided were not sufficient to support approval for this indication, and the company's review that it was not in a position to adequately address this issue at the time. 
The EMA subsequently issued a press release announcing the company's withdrawal of its application, and then one posted the company's letter requesting the withdrawal and publishing a Q&A fact sheet on the application describing the studies used to support the application and linking to the company's letter explaining why it was withdrawn. We could not find a publicly available record indicating whether the company had submitted a similar uh, SNDA to the FDA. The FDA did refer in passing in an unrelated medical review document on another NDA published six months after the EMA announcement to pre-NDA meetings with the company to discuss the bipolar disorder application. The company went on to in peer review, to publish in peer review journals the three studies that tested palperidone in patients with bipolar disorder without disclosing to the readers that its EMA application for approval of Invega for bipolar disorder was withdrawn because the data in the studies was deemed insufficient to support approval. Off-label use of second-generation antipsychotics such as Invega for psychiatric conditions for which they are not approved is widespread. Physicians may have been prescribing in Vega for bipolar disorder with no knowledge of the EMA's regulatory history. It should be noted that Johnson & Johnson, in Vega's maker, was forced to reach a $2.2 billion settlement with the federal government in 2013 over, in part, allegations of off-label promotion of its antipsychotic drugs in Vega and Risperdal. So in conclusion, the FDA must join the EMA and Health Canada in allowing the public to know when a drug is deemed unsafe or ineffective for a certain use when it's been, an application has been submitted to the agency. Even notwithstanding the public health benefits that disclosure of such information would reap, the public has a right to know when, how, and why the nation's largest public health agency reaches major decisions on the products it regulates. Thank you. All right, maybe I'll ask our panelists to come up and sit down and we can start Q&A. Are there, uh, um, there are cards being passed out, so please uh, provide your questions on the cards and, and we'll get to them. Um, so thank you all very much for your comments. So um, maybe first we'll start with, with Peter. So you mentioned uh, in your comments, you, you touched on two different kinds of correcting misinformation. There is correcting mis that, that the FDA can engage in. And the first is correcting information about a specific product, and the second mm -hmm. is more about correcting information about what the FDA does in terms of you know, un understanding that, you know, that it provides these complete response letters and that you know, there might be different, um, different perceptions or understandings of, of, the, of the review that the FDA takes and the information that it provides back to manufacturers. And so those seem like, uh, and it seems like your uh, the, the papers that you talked about were, uh, were about correcting the second kind of misinformation. And maybe that, there's a, a public health functionality to that kind of correcting of misinformation as well, whereas I think a lot of the discussion that, that people presume when they hear about correcting misinformation, they, they think about correcting misinformation about a specific product. So do you think you could um, talk a little bit more about the, the different public health roles that each of those different kinds of, of functions of correcting misinformation can roll? Let me make sure I... I the two, can you just reiterate the two kinds again for me? Yeah, so uh, correcting misinformation about a specific product where there is a, uh, a, pr a particular uh, piece of information out there and, and the FDA has other information. Then there is correcting misinformation out there about what the FDA's role oh, is see, in see. general. And I see, yes. Well, that, that's right. And um, I do think there are misperceptions about what the agency does. And I certainly agree with Dr. Califf and, uh, you know, in his piece in, in, in the journal, um, as you know, from my own personal experience, that you know, certainly one of the most frustrating experiences as an FDA person is to see information that you know to be inaccurate. Um, and I, I can say that you know, when I was working on expanded access, for example, access to unapproved drugs, there was information put out by you know, alleging a certain set of events, which we knew to be much, much more complicated than that. And the place that the FDA especially gets handcuffed, which has not so much been talked about at this forum, is that the policy has been not to even acknowledge the existence of the investigational new drug application or of the new drug application itself, um, meaning 
for those who don't know the terminology here, the initial application to pr either provide the drug to humans for the first time or the attempt to seek uh, approval for marketing. That's really what, what handcuffs the agency. And because they get in this place where you know, not only can they not actually correct the misinformation, they can't even acknowledge that the drug about which there is misinformation is a drug that's before the agency. I mean, that's how far back the, the, you know, the, the, the withholding of information goes. And that is what really handcuffs the agency and as, it puts the agency in this frustrating position of seeing its actions and indeed the overall lay of the land in the scientific literature. Uh, you, they see it being distorted and there's, there's very little that can be done. So I think both are important, obviously. Um, I, I think just one piece of clarification, which I think is of interest uh, with regard to our complete response letter paper, uh, is this. We went out when we began the paper, I think, believing that we might find places where the companies had actively misstated information. Um, and I must say that, by and large, that isn't what we found. Um, what we found were not errors of commission, but rather errors of omission. And I, I, as I showed from our data, very high rates of omission, 85% rates of omission overall. Um, but overall, the, the information that is put out is clearly very heavily vetted by the lawyers. Uh, the SEC documents are you know, rife with cut and pastes within the document and between the, the, the press release and the SEC documents themselves. So they're quite careful in what they put out. But errors of omission themselves can absolutely create a, a misleading profile of the drug, its regulatory status, and what the agency has, has been doing. And that's what I think needs to be remedied. Great, and I think that's a, that's a good transition too to, to some of what you said, Eric, about errors of omission in regard to the uh, reports about the about the uh, anti the antidepressant medications that you studied. And um, it, it seems to me that an error of omission and an error of commissions in these in these cases can have similarly similarly difficult and problematic public health outcomes. Right, they can they can this one, yes, uh, they, they definitely can both affect. Um, you know, whether you're looking at the overall um, proportion of positive versus negative trials, or if you're looking at it uh, from a meta-analytic point of view. So there's the, the first, the omission we call that, uh, that can be called study publication bias, where the entire study is, uh, has not been published. And then there's outcome reporting bias. It goes by many names, spin, uh, p-hacking, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, they can both have an, uh, an impact. And one of the points that you brought up also in your comments is this idea of the, uh, the, the user unfriendliness of a lot of the information. So I was wondering if maybe we could uh, brainstorm for a minute on optimal ways that the FDA could take on this role of, of uh, improving information out there. Um, do we want, to, you know, would it be through tweets or would it be through uh, medical journal articles or just simply putting the information out there on the website? Like, are there... Can we think of better ways to improve the process or make the process more, um, more user-friendly? So you mentioned a couple ideas in, you know, about trying to make the uh, information more searchable. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if, if, if there are other specific ideas you had in that, in that sort of vein. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, it, yeah, you could, um, I, I, to return to the, the concept of transparency versus translucency, you can, you can put the information out there. Again, uh, drugs at FDA has been uh, uh, you know, up online since 1997, but it's still striking how few people know about it. So there's uh, any anyone trying to sell a product would never just arrange to have the market placed on the shelves and never advertise. There needs to be a push. Twitter could be uh, one way of doing it. There could be a deliberate um, uh, attempt to get the information out there to spread it. Um, yeah, th th this th this concept of of being. Uh, uh, sort of hogtied or what, however you put it, it reminds me of another story of what, where the FDA does, tends not to speak at all. It tends to be the silent, uh, I heard the, the, the black box, as was uh, alluded to uh, uh, to earlier. But there was a, uh, I heard a case of a, a drug that had been um, where the, back in the 90s, was the Europeans, uh, people were complaining that this drug was, that the FDA was holding up the show on this, on this new drug. Um, but the truth was that the company had never even submitted it to the FDA. So there was nothing for the FDA to even act on. But they couldn't say, hey, you don't, don't yell at us. They, the sponsor hasn't applied. 
hasn't uh, sent in an IND or NDA, but they couldn't say anything. So the, this, the public is left with the impression that the FDA is just, you know, sitting on it and not doing anything. So the lack of communic communication, I guess, uh, being the common denominator there. May I can make two points to that. I don't think I have a techie answer to this, but I have an optimistic response all the same, which is um, I firmly believe that when these documents spoken collectively here are increasingly made public, um, they will improve. I really believe that. I think that people uh, will find ways, knowing that their documents will be public, is a very foul, powerful pressure upon an FDA medical officer to do a better job of it. And I think that, you know, inevitably there will be, you know, little hiccups along the way as these documents are made public for the first time. But pretty soon people will see the mistakes and they'll redesign the documents in ways that make sense. You know, within complete response letters, for example, uh, it would help if all of these statements that we analyzed were put in, you know, very clear, you know, and just completely clear subheads, perhaps the very same seven that we used, um, so that people would know if something needed to be redacted for some reason, you would know from where it came. And you wouldn't think that the FDA is taking out critical efficacy information because it would be under the manufacturing heading. So I think that, the more, and this I think is the general history of transparency writ large in this country, is that when more transparency comes to bear, the quality of the information over time itself improves. Um, I think uh, the other point, I just want to enlarge on something that Mike said, um, which is, is critical. Um, we are at a moment right now in FDA regulatory history in which the companies, with respect to their free speech rights, are being unleashed. And there is a series of court cases, which you're no doubt more familiar with than I am, that you know, are slowly but surely unleashing the companies to speak more freely. Um, the FDA cannot afford to sit still and silent in that circumstance because it's a kind of one-sided unleashing. Um, and the problem that all of us in this room are so concerned about will only get worse if the companies speak more and the FDA speaks no, no more than it currently does. Mike, did you also I do, Just on the uh, uh, drugs at FDA, I think we use it a lot in our work. And I think once you're familiar with it, it actually is pretty usable. It, uh, it takes a few clicks to get to a particular review, but once you've done it a couple times, you can pretty, within a minute, get if, if it's posted, get to those documents. And I think many of the more recently posted documents, for the most part, are word searchable, mm -hmm. text searchable. The older ones, which, which many of which are scanned, um, they are not, unless you go through the process of taking a PDF program and making it word searchable, which you can do. Um, and uh, so there are, it, I think it is very useful. It's got a wealth of information that I think if, and, and FDA should make it, you know, give maybe have a web page where instructions on how to use it, how to access it, um, uh, and, and, and to the extent that they can make documents searchable when they're posted, to the extent that they don't do that, they should maximize that. So I also wanted to, to come back to this idea of uh, you know, the, the resources that the FDA has and the ability that the FDA has to um, you know, try to, to identify every single piece of information that's out there and then respond in a reasonable period of time. Um, you know, I, I, I do see the, um, the, uh, the issue with trying to put that, that sort of responsibility on the FDA. On the other hand, maybe there are certain hotspots or particular points in time, such as the, um, you know, complete response letter or the, you know, uh, submission of an SNDA or, you know, as I think that the, the case you pointed out in the case where, um, you know, a decision is made by the EMA about a product that's on the market in the U.S. There, that seem like, you know, particularly important um, points in time in the life of a drug where getting the optimal, um, you know, optimal information out there is, is useful. And so, you know, maybe um, you know, as a beginning to trying to develop these standards that uh, uh, for, for intervention that we're talking about, maybe, I, you know, particularly putting out information around these kinds of, of events in the life cycle of a drug is, is one way of going forward. So, I don't know, Mike, do you, so you mentioned this in Vega, um, uh, this in Vega story. Uh, you know, it, it would seem like one thing that, they, that would be very useful was that, is for the FDA to, to report what was going on, what, what went on with this drug in Europe, and the, you know, the, the fact of the EMA putting out this report uh, about, the, about the supplemental use of Invega is, 
it seems like that kind of that 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 should be relatively straightforward to do. And so maybe you want to. I don't know if you could comment on the extent to which um, you know the FDA can weigh the um, or you know can, can try to balance the. Uh, amount of time and effort it would take to try to police everything out there with just trying to be much more strategic about about it. So, um, so the examples I gave they're imperfect, in term, but uh, in the Invega example, one issue is did the FDA it's also get uh, a supplemental new drug application for that drug for that same indication? In in our searching for evidence to enhance the example, couldn't. We're not sure uh, if that's the case. So in cases where FDA hasn't received such an application, I don't know um, what, what role they have in terms of monitoring the drug for other indications that are, where approval is being sought by, in other countries, by the regulators of other countries. I, I suspect they would push back against that idea. Where the FDA did get uh, a parallel submission for that indication and reach a decision, and that decision was to reject it. Um, obviously, uh, in that case, we think they should be fully transparent about that. Um, whether they should be transparent about it, you know, make known information, again, by other regulators in other countries before they've made a decision, again, I think they'd probably push back hard against that as well. But. Um. Yeah, so I, I think um, I, I, I think if we were to have in place all of the documents, you know, outlined in the blueprint now made public, I think that would go a pretty long way to addressing your problem. I mean, I think you know, if the existence of the IND was public, you, you know, you, that would be just that would answer a good fraction of the questions that come before the agency. If we knew that the NDA had been filed or not, when we hear about some company that's claiming effectiveness and they haven't even filed an NDA. Um, you know, to know with certainty that it had or had not uh, would be to change the debate over that product immediately without the FDA having to do much of anything. But with regard to, you know, clear misstatements of information, I, th I think um, there is no way that, this, that the FDA will be policing the, you know, the entire universe of information. That's wholly impractical. But I'll say, you know, <clears throat> from someone who worked at FDA, I think that the instances where that comes up are actually fairly identifiable within the agency. Uh, there are a small number of cases or a modest number of cases <laughs> in which you know it's happening. And you know, I can say that you know, senior officials at that point have a debate over whether or not to set about correcting it. And you know, as Peter Doshi's article in BMJ shows, there have been a limited number of cases in which the FDA has actually gone out, most recently in the Sarepta case by Dr. Califf, and actually pointed out to places where the information was, in fact, misleading. Of course, I think they should be doing more of it. But I'm here to say that the, the number of important cases, which will mostly be about new molecular entities, occasionally about supplemental indications, is actually limited in number. And the agency knows which ones they are. All right, so um, we have a question on, from our online listeners. Um, <laughs> That, uh, so uh, in Canada, psychiatrists don't realize that paliperidone is hydroxyrisperidone, an active metabolite uh, of a longer elimination half-life of the parent drug, so that they are actually chemically linked. And so um, what are the implications for, their, the question is, what are the implications for transparency if prescribers don't necessarily make a connection between one brand name drug and another brand name drug? And is there a, um, a responsibility to, for the FDA to try to bridge that gap for, um, for prescribers and patients. Uh, I'll uh, comment on that being a psychiatrist. Uh, I believe I've, uh, if I recall the labeling, it does not make it, uh, the, the, the uh, labeling does not make it particularly clear that paliperidone is the same as hydroxyrisperidone. Um, I don't know why that was allowed because it seems to be an error of omission, uh, if you will. Um, because um, it, it, by giving it a brand new name, I, I, this would be one, I, I'm sure there are rules uh, regarding this at the FDA. Uh, I know there's a nomenclature committee that decides what drugs can be named uh, for the brand names. I, I, I know less, uh, would know less about the generic names. But um, yeah, I think that's a, um, 
That's a question I, I don't know the answer to. I'd, I'd like to, because I think it is potentially. I, I, I imagine if you took a survey of psychiatrists and you somehow were to be able to disguise the question to find, ascertain uh, whether they actually know that that's the case, uh, my guess is that a minority would be aware of that. Um, sorry, I don't have any <laughs> other comment besides that. Okay, another question from the audience. Um, for uh, Dr. Larry, Dr. Turner, um, do you worry that more disclosure might encourage reviewers to write less down? Um, bringing up the point that uh, maybe FOIA has had unintended consequences of having telephone conversations rather than written correspondence among people within government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I'm sure there'd be a certain measure of that. Um, but you know, in the end, you're a medical reviewer. Um, you're making a recommendation for or against approval of a product. Um, you're probably going to want to put your best case forward. I mean, you do not want to put forward a skimpily argument, a skimpily argued uh, document either. You know, on such a critical question as approval or disapproval. Um, so I, I'm sure there'll be some, um, you know, behind the scenes discussions. Uh, perhaps I've even availed myself of the telephone, you know, once or twice uh, for that very purpose. Um, but I think in the end, the people's pride in their own work and their need to make a convincing case now in the court of public opinion will raise the boat rather than lower it. Eric? Nothing that was eloquent. <laughs> All right, another question from the audience. So we've, um, we've talked about uh, documents as if um, we want something like paper documents out there. Um, but don't we really want information in an organized and, um, and you know, sort of uh, user-friendly way? Um, and so I maybe want to talk about the um, the difference between the FDA trying to put information out there to correct misinformation, uh, just about releasing more information as opposed to trying to organize and, um, and try to you know, construct a um, you know, sort of a science-based uh, response to whatever their, their concern is. Well, so one of the proposals in the blueprint is, is exactly on that point, that you know, the agency does do uh, a certain amount of its own analysis. Uh, and put uh, in particular, there's a set of analyses that often involve the placebo groups of uh, trials of, you know, for, on similar patients. And that information could be aggregated and provide very useful information about natural history of diseases, which would in turn inform sample size calculations for the next trial. Um, they have a database of, of EKG information that I believe is housed at Duke at this point. Uh, that information is information generated by the agency. Um, and there is a request for information from now two, three, well, more years ago than that, um, looking for input on whether or not that information should be made public. So let me tell people um, a secret as long as we're here. And I'm not divulging anything. Um, while the agency is requesting information about whether or not this information should be made public, if anybody here were to file a Freedom of Information Act request, the agency would provide it. It's actually, it's actually available under the Freedom of Information Act. So there's something that's more disclosable than you know. Um, hopefully, the agency will start to proactively describe, to release the information. Um, but file your, your Freedom of Information Act request for, for agency analyses of, of, of existing information. Um, because I agree, you've got a lot of smart people like Eric who looked at these studies for years and years. They've aggregated the data in useful ways that informed their reviews. There's no reason that the public shouldn't be able to have it as long as personal information is removed, as long as product and company inf information is removed, and I believe it can. Uh, that would be very useful information. Are, are you saying unapproved indication uh, you know, reviews, uh, reject NDAs are available through FOIA? No, 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 that's not, that's not what I said. What I said is if the agency has done its own analysis that uses ele, you know, elements of submitted indications, uh, submitted drugs, approved or otherwise, if they took, say, the placebo groups, combined all of the placebo groups, mm -hmm. and then reached some wisdom about the natural history of the disease, that analysis, okay. if the identifiers are removed, is available under FOIA. Um, so final question for the audience, does anybody here have, have thoughts about other products and transparency related to other products, medical devices, um, other FDA regulated products, and how that, uh, whether or not this, there are similar issues in, those, in that kind of a context? As I mentioned, I think the uh, devices could be brought under the same, that if uh, there could be an organization by uh, 
uh, by, by the target uh, target indication, and you could have not only drugs but uh, but devices as well. And perhaps there may be uh, interventions in the dietary supplement category. That would be one thing that could perhaps be done. Um, now, the the method by which these other uh, uh, types of interventions are reviewed is is quite different. That could be an issue. But. So. Um you know, I now work mostly in food, um, and I think that's a whole area not, you know, perhaps of enormous interest to the collected group here, but um, well, other than, you know, in consuming it. But um, the, uh, you know, there is, for example, I, there's probably a lot that can be done in that area. I mean, for, for example, there are outbreaks um, of food-related illness in which the, uh, the supermarkets that have obtained the, uh, the contaminated product are not named by FDA. Um, that's one kind of transparency that would be helpful. Um, another would be there's a process called the grass determination uh, process whereby companies can self-certify that they believe that an additive that they're putting into a product is generally recognized as safe, grass. They self-certify. They are not even required to provide information to the, to the FDA on what basis they did so. Uh, all of those things, I think, would, would be helpful. So I think, we, I think you know, as often is the case at FDA, the drug area is what leads us into, into new conceptual areas like transparency. Um, but I, I think your, your question is an excellent one. And we should be thinking as well about uh, whether they're tobacco or applications and the like that ought to, ought to be made public, um, veterinary medicine applications, all of those um, have not been the subject of debate, but really ought to be. All right. Well, thank you all very much. It's been a, a very useful conversation, and hopefully this will help generate some uh, ideas as we, as we move further in trying to think about the different standards and, and, uh, and recommendations for the FDA. It seems like, and it also seems like the FDA is very engaged. So thank you for your, thank you for your comments and contributions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was uh, terrific. Um, and that brings to a close today's session. I just um, want to say on behalf of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Dean McKenzie, I want to thank all of the panelists, all the people who came, um, the FDA, in particular the commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, uh, C-SPAN, and everyone who's watched um, or will yet watch when this is played many times, or we're going to keep it on our website. I'm going to tell you the website address. It's uh, jhsph.edu, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health.edu, uh, slash FDA-transparency. So um, uh, people can watch any parts they want to play again. Um, you can hear the different parts where people said, I'm going to tell you a secret. That happened a few times. Uh, we can relive that ex those exciting moments. Um, and, uh, but the, the overall message, I think, that came through from many different perspectives is that uh, transparency is an issue that's been around FDA for a while and um, has tremendous uh, potential for uh, improving information available to patients, doctors, researchers, companies, and it may be an issue as time has come. And uh, hopefully today's steps by FDA um, will uh, lead to more, and we'll be able to see the value of transparency. So th thank you all for coming and participating.